request to remove a restriction on the sale of NIPS uh, or uh, liquor in a certain format for liquor junction in one general way. Um, and a, a request to approve the change in Sunday hours for liquor stores generally, as well as renewal or approval of the uh, uh, liquor licenses that's done annually. We'll um, then move to a hearing on the uh, fiscal 15 classification plan and chat uh, regards uh, proposed charter changes. Um, we'll then move to executive session with regard to uh, collective bargaining topics. Um, with that, uh, my only liaison report is uh, uh, the board's been quite busy with regard to town meeting, which will enter its fourth night on Thursday. Um, it's been a, uh, I think, a productive, uh, although tiring, agenda. And uh, we're finally getting the review of the um, uh, zoning rules that have been worked on so hard by so many people. And I think from my standpoint, although it's taken a while to get going, the, uh, the quality and the number of comments have been uh, what I would hope. They're constructive, they are generally er error-based or oversights, and I think people are now starting to see the energy and quality that was put into the document. Um, so with that, I'll turn to my right. Dan, any comments? Uh, I have no uh, further report. Sure. Tom? Um, since we last met, I've attended uh, two Board of Health uh, committee meetings. They have been working pretty conscientiously over the last six weeks or so strategic plan, a five-year plan for evaluating where they are, uh, where they would like to be. Um, um, last night, um, they are at what I would call the final draft of that. Um, it started with a, um, not last night, but this process started with a public meeting that also invited related and interested parties uh, from Winchester Hospital and Hallmark and among others. Um, and um, Sanborn Place was, was part of that. There was about 25 people that <coughs> offered input. That was all collated by a, a facilitator that uh, they received a grant to, uh, to help them. And um, I, I think that they're, they've, they've boiled a lot of work down to five or six pages and a lot of uh, various attached um, appendix items and um, and I think that we're going to be hearing from them in January. I think, Bob, it's probably going to be in your hands. I'm, I'd be surprised if it's not in your hands by the early to the middle of next week. Um, and um, the, um, the meeting for the uh, early childhood space has been postponed. I think they just had too many things December 4th, and um, that's really all I have for right now. Good, thank you, John. Kevin, any comments? <coughs> um, yeah, well, John's leaving out one. I'm sure he left it for me to hit. So, um, John Halsey and myself attended the uh, Veterans um, Day breakfast on back on the 11th. It was down at the Pleasant Street Center. Um, they had a good crowd. They had, um, I'm going to forget this number because I think it's higher than that, but they said they had, oh, they felt over 100 people rotating in and out. Oh, I believe there was 100 people in and out for yeah. breakfast on, and then for they that, way over the to the hour and a half period of time that they had. That's pretty more. impressive. Yeah, it was. It was. It was nice to see. There was a good mix of um, of families, uh, veterans there, wives of of, um, of previous veterans, and then they set up. They have. It's really nice. They have the Boy Scouts set up uh, right out on on the patio area of the Pleasant Street Center. They march them up Haven Street, cross over uh, into um, uh, the parking area uh, right on the other side of Main, and then up to the common area where they had uh, a couple of keynote speakers. Um, one of them, uh, Bill, do you remember the, the, the major's name? Major? I don't think so. don't have it off the top of my head. I forgot to write it down. Um, but fr um, Frank put on a very nice um, morning. Um, yeah. Really was very, very respectful. Um, he had uh, the class from I think it was Joshua Eaton. I forget which grade came up. They all they all wrote their own poem, uh, and they were great. Very great. Was it third grade? Yeah, no, they they were excellent. I, I think there was a dozen poem. of them. It was 
nice. Yeah, it was, it was really nice. It was really nice. It was really um, kind of cute. Yeah, and so it was, it was a really nice ceremony that was nice to see. There was good crowd participation too. I think other than just the parents of the third <laughs> graders that were there. Um, so it was a nice, nice crowd for, for, for people out there. And like I said, the major with the, um, um, is he with the reserves? National Guard. National Guard. Yeah. Okay. Um, Weekend Warriors. What's that? Weekend we we can Warriors. Well, he's, he's a uh, Reading resident. Uh, grew up in Reading. Mm -hmm. uh, went to school in Reading. Uh, gave a really nice um, speech uh, as, as well on it. So it was, a, it was a nice morning. Very good tribute uh, to the veterans here in town and, and, and everywhere. So. Yeah, and he was a Weekend Warrior, but he actually has done, I, I, know. I think, three tours in the Middle East. I thought it was four, maybe, right? Three yeah, or four. Yeah. I mean, he, he was very impressive, and, and it was kind of nice. He, uh, you know, he started his speech by, uh, you know, identifying himself as a rocket. I think he actually <laughs> graduated with uh, one of my daughters, uh, so it was very nice to see him back with his family. And, yeah. You know, after a career in the military. Yeah. That's all I have. Good. Um, with that, anyone? here tonight that would like to provide public comment. Mr. Brown. To follow up on the Veterans Day, I don't know if they are aware or not, but both stones are in the cemeteries. The bench at uh, Charles Lawn and the headstone at uh, and Wood End. And they come up nice. And again, Frankie did a hell of a job. And we both had to sit down and make sure the emblems were in the right order. <laughs> <laughs> We did screw up once, but we were still real tight. There is a there is a military protocol, and Kevin, I don't know if you you noticed the uh, uh, front of the uh, brochure that Frankie put out. Well, and I, I rag it once in a while. I, I think you told me about this. Yeah. Ago, yeah. Uh, the Marine had his weapon on the wrong shoulder, <laughs> and that's very unusual for them. Of the five military branches, they are perhaps the sharpest coming from the Air Force One. And John, I, I do appreciate that, but it's the inter, inter uh, military rivalry that we have. Uh, well, know. I noticed that it was an Air Force man calling a Marine out about uh, a yeah. Marine doing it wrong. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you get a rag him once. Because my favorite thing with Frankie is I keep telling him I served two years on the shores of Tripoli and he never did. And, and I believe he went on to uh, to back up um, his his own tours uh, right after that. Yeah. I believe. Well, it's nice to see <laughs> the rivalries don't end with your with uh, the formal service. So. No, no. Um, we all should, and we all should. Very good, Bob. Any comments or amplify your report? Um, the um, the cultural group that some of you have attended was just meeting tonight. I just got back from that. Um, uh, in a very quiet way. It's very energized small core right now. Uh, I didn't. I wasn't able to go to two meetings ago when they got the final report delivered, so I only saw it secondhand. Um, but I think a couple of years from now they're going to be a force to be reckoned with. They're just plotting their strategy of how to coalesce and how to get a sort of a branding and how to get out there with a name. Um, they may well um, go as far as uh, you know fundraising and, and driving towards their own building. I don't really know. That's, that's probably the highest goal they could achieve. But uh, virtually every cultural organization in town is tied into this somehow or another. Some more enthusiastically than others, but none are in opposition. It's all, it's an idea of marketing, if you will, uh, Reading as a cultural destination. And the inventory the consultant put together was staggering as to how much is in this town. You know, you, you think, oh yeah, that one, I've heard of that. Oh yeah, I heard of that one. You don't really think until you see it all in one location how much we actually have. Do you care to guess how many individual groups are represented? Hundreds. It's a lot. Wow. Um, and interestingly, not all of them knew about each other. <laughs> so they have a problem. So you know, there is a marketing issue. Yeah. Um, and unlike maybe some businesses, there's really not a lot of rivalry there. Um, you know, artists as a group, let's just speak to them because Reading Art was there. They're all thrilled that all of them get publicity. Sure. Um, you know, it, it's more, you know, the rising tide will lift all boats kind of approach. So I think you'll be hearing about them. And, and they described some uh, efforts to get out there in front of the public in the next year or two at some events. Do it in a cohesive way, which that's what booth will be impressive. It's, it, any 
one of them could go out to any one, like the Fall Street Fair, and have a booth. No big deal. To have eight booths together and to have them all there with representatives from 25 or 50 organizations with a brand name, that'd be pretty powerful. Can you guess that if it's hundreds of groups, what do you think the head count is represented? Um, the head count that's interested in this goes well beyond Reading people. So it's already reached out probably to 50 miles in every direction. So it's impossible to know. Um, there are communities on the shore, on the shore of the beaches, the seashore, uh, Salem, Beverly area. There's not a lot going on inland. So the fact that Reading is interested in this has really spread like wildfire. Um, so, you know, again, we'll see kind of where it goes and what it does. Uh, but typically when Reading, when the community of Reading does something, it kind of does a top notch. Be surprised if this turns into something pretty good. Um, I just wanted to remind you that we did add a meeting in January. Um, we were trying to add a meeting in December. That just didn't work out. I believe that only three of you are available for the December 2nd meeting. We can confirm that as we get closer to the day. Um, we can close the warrant for January, either December 2nd or December 9th. It doesn't really matter. But you do need to vote on December 9th. So if you want to close it the same night, you can. I don't think there's any harm in closing the warrant on the second with only three people here. Um, you saw a draft of the um, articles. There's really just the permanent building committee <coughs> and the charter and then a bunch of housekeeping things if there's anything to do with, uh, with money, which I don't know of any right now, other than we hope to have the pay and class results. Um, FY16 budgets are underway. <coughs> uh, they're complex. They're within comms guides of two and a half. doesn't really allow us to add much anything, uh, just to kind of go into survival mode. But um, different departments um, are challenging themselves to rethink the way they do things and rearrange, if you will. Um, because we have to, we have to assume, at least I would assume, there won't be an override for many years. And you have to build the core of your services with that in mind. But then you have to build it so it's scalable, so if all of a sudden money falls out of the sky, you can have a list of this is what I do with it. Punch this. Um, and in the past, I'll say, um, community services as one example, a whole bunch of things just kind of tossed in there because it's miscellaneous. Um, as it is now, we have I don't know, three quarters of the employees in there are part time. So whatever the reason is someone comes to community services to want something, the odds are of you finding that person here are not perfect. So we're kind of looking at all the models the best long-term service delivery method for all departments. Um, you know, you'll, you'll have a busier budget season this year, I think, than in seven years. Partly for a financial challenge and partly really for you to a longer-term plan. With, again, the idea of what we can have right discussion the next year. Um, so for now, we've just scheduled two January meetings, but, you know, as John has mentioned, and I know I've talked to the council on aging, is real interest in the volunteer community going forward and describing to you personally what it is they see that we're short on. This is what we do well, but these are the things we're not doing. And I think it's important to hear that. Mm -hmm. so it, it's possible that two nights of budgets may not be enough. We may have to have a third. We just have to play that by ear. Right? <coughs> Normally two nights is this um, <coughs> On January 27th, I'd like to have a much advertised private road discussion. Um, there's two kinds of private roads that are going to come in front of you. One is by accident, one is on purpose. The, uh, the by accident ones are the developers that left town, left money behind perhaps, and never fully did all the paperwork. They were supposed to have a public road. And many of the residents in some of the areas up around Wood End are just now finding out 20 years later that it's not a public road. The paperwork was not completed. And they find out when starts to wear down and it needs repairs. So 20 years is difficult. Um, my own opinion, and we'll have town council at that meeting, is their situation is quite different than someone who consciously lives on a private road and knew they bought a house on a private road, and that was a conscious choice sure. that someone made long ago. Uh, in the past, we've treated both the same, although the, the second or first group is a little bit new. Um, past boards have had very high standards to bring a road up to snuff if you were ready to become a public road with granite curbing and the whole nine yards. Um, that was 
relaxed within the last couple of years. I know down at um, Woodland Road, I think it is, or Woodland Street, it's Woodland Road, behind a baseball park. Um, there were six houses, and they relaxed the standards a little bit because there was no need to have a grant permit on the help side. So that's, that's something you'll need to think about, and, and we'll certainly start the discussion. Types, and I'd like to try to bring the accidental private roads to an April town meeting article to accept them as public under whatever terms you decide. Uh, but that will require us to uh, have about a month to work on it from January, late January to late February when the warrant closes. So we'll see how that works. I get a call probably about once a month from some of these people saying, When am I going to have the meeting? Because again, a lot of people just found out they had no idea. They mentioned earlier that in some cases escrowed funds have been left behind? Yeah, finding them should be a challenge. There's not very many of them, but mm. yeah, there's, there's bonds that have been forfeited that are held upstairs or held in a bank account somewhere. And that'll be part of the discussion. Okay. <coughs> um, I think that's all. If you have a full agenda tonight. Okay. Uh, with that, uh, if there are no other comments, we'll move directly to our uh, first discussion item, which is presentation from RMLD regarding the uh, LED program. Public and, uh, comment? Sir? Did you? No, did. We did public you comment. Did? Really. Okay, I missed it. Uh, Colleen? as I mentioned at the town meeting, uh, from a reactive um, uh, type of operation to a proactive planning operation. An organizational reliability study are critical to establishing long-term planning to ensure that RMLD remains competitive and successfully meets the ongoing challenges of the electric industry. And I think I had mentioned um, that the electric industry uh, is changing uh, in, a, in a major way in 2017 and 18, where um, uh, capacity and transmission uh, in this meaner zone Boston area uh, will be uh, implemented on all of us. And the rates will increase. <coughs> Power supply itself is a pass through, and recently we unbundled our rates. Um, did a um, RCTV presentation, which you can all watch. Uh, Dan and I sat there and explained how the rates are bundled. And the reason why I did that is so that now each of the line items matches uh, other IOUs so that you can see what is power supply, what is operations and maintenance. And it's, there's no longer integrated into base rate, so it's clear. What's a pass through? What is the operating maintenance cost of us? And we're doing a budget to actual. What's the first bill you'd expect to benefit from that? What's the first uh, consumer uh, statement that we have that unbundling? That came out in July. The first unbundled bill is in July. So if you look at the bill and you can look at the previous one, if you have any questions, you can go on RCTV and you can go line item by line item. And we also had some canned questions and stuff. Um, if there's any other questions, then you can, you can call over or talk to me or whatever. Um, but one of the 
once you unbundle the bill, we're trying to take the six-year plan and you unbundle that so that you can have a different line item so that we can make sure every single month where we are. Because all we ever want to happen, what happened when we first got hired, is this um, an assumption of growth that didn't occur um, that is you know, anticipated previously. So we want to make sure that we're doing that analysis monthly. Um, and also to be able to give each of the towns and the schools you know, what they can expect for their subsequent budget. Um, and we're, we're analyzing that monthly because the electric system is becoming very volatile. I mean, it's ever changing since 1998 during deregulation, but it, it seems like the FERC and the so they just they just keep taking new and new more rules and you know it's it's becoming costly and um, they want to build a lot more capacity and transmission to get to this area. <coughs> In this presentation uh, I'll go over our mission statement. Um, I'm going to just go briefly over the organizational and reliability study. Brian's going to touch on the LED streetlight program thus far. Uh, Brian will also touch on the tree trimming. And um, Jane will come up and speak to the charging station in our commercial rebate programs. The RMLD is committed to providing excellent customer service, including competitively priced electricity as a result of diligence in the areas of power supply risk management, system reliability and flexibility, and overall business efficiency. You can't really see these numbers. That's because they're so small. Because they're so small. Um, Ranked at one of the lowest in the state. What we're showing here is most of the contiguous towns like Peabody and Middleton. Um, we have NSTAR and National Grid. Um, and in almost all categories, we're uh, ranked as one of the lowest. Um, Peabody, as you know, has some generation. Uh, so they're low in a couple of them. But pretty much of all the municipals in the state um, in the other IOUs, we're, we're right around about the third lowest. Um, which we intend to keep that way. Even what do you think, what would you cite is the reason we're able to get <coughs> efficiencies beyond, beyond the other municipal? What, what's the... My personal opinion? Yeah. Um, I, I think that utilities that have uh, power supply analysts that put together the portfolios um, and that are structuring the portfolios and watching the market, uh, putting the diversity into the portfolio, um, like if you're buying hydro, you want run of the river, low risk, and, and their job is to make sure that you're getting the lowest price power supply, uh, and they do a lot of work to make sure that it's um, it's competitive. I mean, we'll have prices come in from, we just did a whole uh, price thing. Prices come in, they have to be locked in with an hour, and, and they're pretty competitive, and we make sure that our, our, guar our guarantees are in line. Um, and, and you walk in some really solid um, markets, but you you also have long-term, you know, 9x gas prices that you're following. It, it can get quite complicated, as you would expect, like someone who follows the stock market or stock. You know, it's it's similar. Um, but we have strategies that you know lock in. If it goes between this and this, uh, you know, you'll lock it in. You can lock in tranches. We do a layering and laddering type approach. Jane can explain it a little bit more, but that diligence, um, most of the utilities, or I would say the, the majority of the utilities that have power supply groups that specialize in this niche type thing, that handle both retail and, and wholesale, uh, generally will have the lowest prices in the state. Um, National Grid and, um, you know, they pay to stock owners. Our power supply is complete pass through. We don't make any money off of that. Um, National Grid, because they're not deregulated, they go every six months and they buy power contracts because they weren't able to keep their long-term contracts like us. So they'll reconcile ahead and um, uh, reconcile them back and then project ahead. So there's changes every you know, November and May. Uh, their recent increase was 34 point something percent. Whereas, you know, I know that was the Lion Brush tour, but that was uh, 4% and 1.3% over the last three or four years, which was still um, you know, pretty significantly low. Um, but we, we, I want to make sure that there's no surprises like that again. I mean, that, that was more what was upsetting, I think, than it was that, that the increase was, uh, was normal. 
But anyway, it's about third, a third in the state, and you need to keep it that way. Um, I'm going to go over the reliability indices just a, a little bit. Um, Sadie, Katie, I, I wrote on the right hand side of Sadie, it's the total duration of customer interruptions over the total number of customers served. So it's a different way of, of evaluating outages. Um, and in the case of Sadie and, um, and Katie, we are well below the national and regional averages, and we want to stay that way. Um, that will start to creep up because of weather, because of maintenance, uh, it has a number of factors. But right now, regional and national. And these are interesting reliability statistics, and we put them out there for political purposes and to <coughs> share. But generally, what, what we use these for is we're tracking what's causing the outages so that we can, we can fund the money into areas. Like if we find that it's the majority of the trees that are causing it, or maybe we're having um, a significant amount of fuse, fuses that are blowing. Uh, we track and trend what's actually occurring so that we can target to fix those areas. Um, so we're using it internally in engineering to, to improve reliability, and then we turn around and we try to be uh, you know, in comparison with the rest of the country by using these standardized indices. Um, we collect just about every blink where a lot of the large IOUs, they may not collect it for a minute or five minutes because they're trying to show good numbers, where I'm really trying to figure out what's happening so that we can fix it. What was the total number of interruptions in those two charts? Do that? Yeah, those are averages, so they're hard to figure out. Are there minutes, a uh, number of minutes in a row? Well, the KD is, is, is minutes per interruption, and the, the other one is minutes per customer serve. But I wonder the number of interruptions. Just curious. Yeah, I'm going to go to the next slide. The maybe under total number of customer interruptions over total number of customers served under safety. Yeah, you look at that lower right hand box and add up all those numbers, you get the answers. Can, can you send us this presentation? Sure. It's, it's, it's on um, the laptop. Oh, it is. <laughs> okay. We sets. actually um, present this at every commission <coughs> meeting once a month. Do you have do you have copies of this? It's it's easier. So I mean it's easier to see if you can yeah. look at the numbers, yeah. right? Yeah. So, so right now point. we're going out for a new tree trimming contract and one of the, the things that we're doing, uh, and Brian will speak to a little bit, is we'll have a master arborist in this contract, which has a lot more accountability and we'll be speaking we'll be better liaison with the tree wardens, um, because we want that green box to go down a little bit and um, we want the cyclic to be three to five year cyclic um, training plan, which is, would give you the most productivity and efficiency, um, being that trees are your number one outage cause. The motor vehicle hits 10. We did have a lot this past summer. Um, what is that blue, the, the large blue? The large blue is equipment. Um, it's any type of equipment failure. A lot of times they're fuses um, that are actually performing their safety function, but if they blow or they're not, they're still considered a, a, an equipment. Um, a transformer leaking, um, overloaded transformers. I mean, we're trying to get our GIS up to date so that we can have, you know, the, the peak information come from <coughs> our business into the transformer so that we know it's loaded properly. Overloaded, it's costing money. Underloaded, it's costing money. So um, our focus is on getting the GIS built. The organizational study goals, uh, long-term study focusing on the direct impacts to the efficiency of the utility with the context of trends and best practices identified in the electric industry. Um, I know that Marcy was there for their presentation. Um, these are some of the targeted areas uh, that are in that organizational study. Um, when I wrote the RFP, what we're trying to find is, you know, what is the right amount of people doing the right amount of things with the right skill sets um, for where the business is now and where it needs to go to stay competitive in the future. And it isn't just made up by right. I mean, we have a lot of utilities in this country and a lot of utilities in the state of Massachusetts. And uh, we know where the utilities are going, the volatility. Um, and we just, you know, we know what um, you know, rules and, and things are coming down, down the pike from NERC. 
uh, and, and these companies that we hired, we gave the organizational study to Lidos, we did an RFP, and the reliability study got given to who? Lidos used to be RW back, it's changed names a couple of times, and Boots a you know, long term uh, reliability company down, and I believe South Carolina. So this a uh, couple more of the organizational study, um, and we'll go into them. Uh, if you have any questions on them, you can always give me a call, shoot me an email, and I can give you a little bit more uh, on those. But I think from an organizational standpoint, those cover the, the main topics that you would want to do. And I know when, when Bob took over here, I'm sure he, he addressed a, a number of the ones that are listed. That sounds like a lot of peer review, looking at uh I'd be curious, well that's benchmarking, I'd also be curious, what do you think, does any part of this include uh, disruptive improvements in the industry, for example, remote monitoring or um, different reliability components? Is there anything in this industry that's um, notable in terms of reducing recurring or fixed spend, either because of the impl implementation of technology to do some of the remote monitoring, or we're going to talk about LEDs in a bit, that's going to change your use model and replacement rate. Are those factored in here as well? Um, what do we do differently that changes the game as opposed to how do we do what we're doing better? Yeah, this, the organizational study is more people and processes uh, and skill sets, uh, um, performance appraisals, um, development of, of plans, uh, making sure that the salary ranges are not <coughs> out of whack, um, and, and restructuring um, maybe how some of the structure is set up is not conducive to the best communication between the different groups. Um, and and that's, that's what that's looking at. The reliability um, study is a, also a 20 year plan that will go 20 years, 10 years, five, and into one year. <coughs> you come up with the recommendations, they'll give you the cost estimate and the timeline to do these types of things. Um, Having done organizational reliability studies myself in the past, um, I've put together some roadmaps of, of what I'm visualizing. I've made some changes that I thought were just pretty obvious, um, but a lot of them I, I, I put on hold because you know, I typically don't hire uh, consultants unless I, I need them to, to be independent review of me. So I don't share with them what I'm thinking. I want to see what they have to say. So that in being from an engineer standpoint, you, you might be able to layer on the best and come up with the best product. Um, I just, when I got here, we just I kind of did a quick assessment just for any smoking guns or whatever like that. Mm -hmm. and, um, so for the reliability goals, uh, condition assessment, bill review, system protection, they go to the substations. Um, and again, they're going to be focusing on uh, helping us just build a, a a skeleton of the GIS so that you can do the loading, the load study. You can't tell if you have proper capacity in all of the different sections of your town if you don't have a GIS. It's really your fundamental um, foundation. Um, you improve your system losses, you make the system flexible, and then you're able to um, you're able to offer the programs like the main response and, and, and other things that will help you to shave your peak because that's where you're going to save your money. This is some more of the topics that the reliability study will take a look at. Um, so, can you keep that to the question one more time? In any industry, there's what do we do that we do today more efficiently? And there's what do we do differently that just changes the way things work? I can only speculate what some of them might be by way of example. It could be that instead of using a truck roll, some more diagnostics could be done remotely using technology. I'm making that up, but maybe it's something like that exists. Another might be you change the way the, um, the materials used or the, the techniques used. Some, uh, the lighting is one, one big example. Um, I just had a third example and it went out of my head. Uh, but it's more what do we do differently that changes the way that this works? And part of that goes to what's disruptive in the industry that um, I mean, everyone's, every one of these municipalities is facing the same problem. You've all got the same variables, the same levers and knobs to pull on to right. run the business. Right. So what are you going to do differently, or is there anything that can be done differently? Well, um, there's, there's basic 
modernization um, steps that um, that most utilities have taken that would have been put in smart meters in OMEN. And as I mentioned before, we would have been put smart meters in OMEN. They're not two-way communicators, so we have to we have to we have to accommodate for that. You know, having an ability to get current and voltage at the end of each circuit uh, certainly. It, it, it's like taking your pulse. You know, you know what's going on at the end because voltage drops as it goes towards the end of the line. Um, some of your NERC compliance issues as it ties into transmission is calling for uh, mechanical relaying to go to solid state so that it can communicate with all of the relaying on the transmission system. Uh, we'll be expanding our SCADA somewhat. Once we get the GIS done, it'll tie into the SCADA. We'll add a little bit more of uh, automation and functionality, whereas capacitor banks um, that sit on the lines, they're not really placed where they can reduce your losses. Um, you'd want them automated. Right now, we'll have a truck roll out, and they'll turn them on, and then they'll turn them off, as opposed to riding the load profile, so you'll get a lot less losses there, a lot less uh, foam on the bear, if you will, so that we're not paying for the foam. Um, the commercial, uh, I put, had put a stop to the commercial meters so that we would put full two-way communicators in with them so that we can talk to our larger commercial customers and offer them that peak shaving incentive because we have peak shaving once a year for the large peak and then we have transmission um, peak once a month. So there's an ability to share. Um, you know, so there'll be some modernization changes made. Um, but again, a lot of our focus is, is going to be getting that GIS up and done and running within the next few years um, is really what our goal is um, and, and getting a lot of the procedures and practices in place. So, so what's the timeline planned on the GIS? Because I think that's been underway for quite a while, right? I mean, I think even before you got here, they were working on the GIS, right? Yeah. How long has that been, been sort of in process? I think it's been in process for a long time. And, and what's the plan for when it might be um, I kind of have to start over because what happens is when you're building a GIS you have to have a plan and like I started off we're changing the RMLD from a reactive to a proactive company and you know you can build a GIS but if you don't have a long-term plan of what it's going to look like and what you're going to use it for then it starts to lose its <coughs> vision and your processes of how you're getting that as-built information back to the GIS um, just kind of falls to so the wayside. So all the costs that have been put in are really sunk costs. Not, it's not all or gone. Or it's gonna be yeah, it's it's not all gone. But the the data collection, um, there hasn't been a process for as-built data collection to the point where you know if you had a Rand McNally map mm -hmm. and it looks really good, and you want to go to Florida and you're following Florida and you end up in Ohio, you're like, well, how did that happen? It looked really good. How did I get in Ohio? So a lot of the data that was put in there, some of it was defaulted, mm. thinking that they could use some engineering modeling systems as long as there was connectivity, but defaulted information doesn't help because mm. what you want the GIS to tell you is that particular cable doesn't have enough capacity it needs to be upgraded. So I just don't think there was, um, <coughs> You know, there wasn't a GIS plan that's that was laid out to get you there, mm -hmm. um, and and there needs to be, and we will get that done because everything is hinging on that GIS. Your your engineering modeling, your long term planning, everything. Did you think to Marcy's question? Did you think back to what what was what's the root cause of the original failure? Why was it? Why was the investment in the path taken earlier? Ultimately, a failure. What's root cause? I just think that in in general, um, the the failure has been there hasn't been, it hasn't been a planning company. So, can you just? I, I think I it, I don't know that that sounds too simple, but everything has to be planned out. Like, you 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 draw a road map and you say this is what it looks now. Like, let's say it's a project that takes a year. This is what it looks like now. This is what it's going to look like in a year. This is the functions I need out of it. And you say, okay, I want 30 functions. Okay, well, do we really need 30 functions? Because you only want to maintain the monster that you can maintain. It's nice to have all these bells and whistles and up to 100,000 layers, but if you only need these things to do your engineering studies, you may only need five layers. 
and you may only need these few access databases. And you just really streamline it so that that's all you're expecting the engineers to bring back to the field. That's all you're expecting to, to take care of so that you know that it's 100% accurate. And then we're putting it on, we have a SharePoint at work and we're gonna be putting up dashboards so that you're seeing every day, what are we selling? What's going on? What, you know, each, each group will have a little dashboard. So as I hear you say that, it sounds like the original vision was too expansive and it couldn't be executed. It may not have been too expansive. It just wasn't, carry, they didn't have a process to carry it through because I don't really know that they knew what, what it was going to be used for. Like they didn't visualize what are we going to use this for. Okay, thank you. Huh? I don't know her organization nearly as well, but in ours, uh, first of all, technology people are always interested. Um, we need, and I'm sure you need, technology people that understand what the business is. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they're extremely practical. They understand the objective. A lot of technology people don't don't have that. Right. And if you go to a, a technology firm of any sort, there's no chance you're going to get that. They're going to sell you the most elegant thing that has this million dollars <coughs> and looks really pretty, and all of a sudden you are in Ohio. Um, right. So it's and sometimes it's easy to and we've done one thing. I won't mention which software, but we bought a software package, and we pretty much ended up in Ohio. But it looked really good. It said Florida. <laughs> Look how warm it is. <laughs> and so we've had to spend a lot of time on our own training the company as to what they should have really built for the market. Right. So it's technology is a real tough area because there's the theoretical people and there's the marketing people and then there's the actual users. Yeah. And they seem to almost be ignored in that process. God bless them. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the good part is that, you know, um, Hamid and I have both built GIS. We know exactly what we need to what it needs to produce. We don't need to ask anybody. You want double poles? You need to know double poles, right? That's the political mm -hmm. thing. You want all your double poles. You want all your transformer load management, okay? You want to know, you want to have um, your system planning and your contingencies so you know if this is out, this is going to be able to connect in and you'll have enough capacity for those contingency backups so that you can get power back in right away. What do you mean by double poles? Sorry. <laughs> when they put it, when a pole gets hit by like a motor vehicle uh -huh. and you place another oh, pole where the Verizon okay. does or not, mm -hmm. um, right now they don't have a ball and court. So typically what happens is electrical transfer mm -hmm. and then you call Comcast and you say, okay, it's time for you to transfer. And then they go to Verizon, it's time for you to transfer. And there'll be a software that there's a ball and court. So you always know. Mm -hmm. And the selectmen like that because you call me on the phone and you'd be like, there's too many double poles and I'll just have all the linemen go out on Saturday and we'll get them all done and then I'll give you a list and you'll be really mad at Comcast because they're way behind. And you'll say, we want Comcast to get all their, you know, so you'll be able to have a list of who's holding up the double pole for the transfer. But they don't have a transfer um, software right now. We're going to join Verizon's in January. So we'll have that ball in court. But what you maintain on your GIS and what you're looking for to maintain the best reliability for an electric system is not a lot. And those are what we're targeting. We just need the databases to be accurate. Because when you're doing an electric system, if, if anybody here understands electricity, if, if your wire, a foot is, is voltage drop as it goes towards the end of the line, you can't have a GPS collecting it that's plus or minus 20 feet. You have to have an engineering grade collection so that you're only off by a foot so that you actually know that that person at the end of the line has got 120 volts. Because if it's not, you, you're gonna start burning up some of their appliances. So it, you know, it's not big bells and whistles, it's very basic um, and, um, and that's what we're, we're aiming at, that basic foundation. We don't have really. No. Are we solving for a problem we have, or are we solving for a problem right. that we might have? Because there's costs involved, right, in solving for problems. So is it one that we have, we know it exists, or is it one that we think could exist? It exists in some areas. It doesn't exi exist predominantly. But let's say it's the summertime, and the ISO calls for a voltage reduction, because yep. we have voltage reductions all the time and I have to go to the substation and I have to take off 5%. Right now, because those meters, I don't know what they have at the end, and I drop that 5%, I don't know what I got, and I need to know what I have. That's, 
in, in, so you build an anticipation of making sure that that's not going to happen. What's the um, consequence today of not having that visibility? What happens today? Well, you know, when I first came and I found out that we didn't have, uh, a, a, you know, a pulse at the end, um, you'd have to take, and, and the ISO's calling for 5%, I'd have to give, them, give it to them because it's mandated in a, in a different method. I have to give them a circuit. Whatever equals 5%, I'd have to give it to them someplace different. It's better to give 5% because if I lower it 5%, most people's appliances won't even feel that unless it's a highly sensitive solid state piece of equipment. But if I have to give them 5% and I don't know what the voltage is at the end, I'll have to just take out a circuit. Because if you don't, you get fined. So I want to do it the right way. Yeah. And um, so that's what we're focusing on. So um, I, I was there for the reliability yeah. of organizational study presentations and I thought that the firms seemed like they were very impressive and really did seem like they know what they're doing and I think it's probably a really good thing that you're that you're getting those you know in play yeah um, I, I'm curious to know what what have you laid out to them in terms of like what your objectives are for the organization so in other words we want to be the most efficient possible we want to be the most customer friendly possible like what what are what kind of what have you told them is your vision, you know, mission, and vision and mission in terms of the organization because that obviously drives what kind of answers that we was get in back the mission statement that we said um, they um, we want to be efficient and um, in, in productive. Okay, so that's that's the, it's based um, around the mission statement. It's yeah. based around the mission statement, and um, that's what we're driving at. We're we're not trying to be, you know, Uber Smart Grid. We're not trying to be. I mean, we have good customer service. Our customers like us. Um, we don't want to. We don't want to fix things that aren't broken. We just want to make the system flexible, so that we can stay competitive. And we want to do it for the least amount of money possible. And um, the one good thing you have, I think, with with some of the talent we have, and in, in myself and Hamid, is we're able to do a lot of the engineering in house. And we're trying to teach some of the other engineers how to do it as well, because not having to use consultants saves a lot of money. Um, and that's a good thing. So, um, you know, so that's what that's what we're trying to do. And um, and I look forward to giving you an update after. I think, you know, it's a it's a very if I can use the term naked, it's a very naked thing to do. When you do an organization and reliability study. You know, I, I'm welcoming them in to criticize and say whatever and give us a list because I really want to know what it is. And I want to know if it matches what I already know. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, you don't always get, like, you know, super awesome things and whatever. And like I said, I maintain a level of independent review because I don't want to feed them any information because then it defeats the purpose of me getting in that independent review. You know what I mean? So... Okay, um, this, this slide just basically shows how you take the organizational study and the reliability study and it comes together uh, for, you know, so that you can come up with your 20 year plan. Um, and then we'll go back and we'll take the strategic plan that was written in 2008 and we'll, and the last piece will be to upgrade that. Um, but the, these organizational and reliability studies will be written out again in one year, in five year, and in 10 year. And in any, all the recommendations will come with a cost and priorities, and we'll have to sit down and say, yeah, that needs to be done, yeah, that doesn't need to be done, and that'll all be shared. Okay, I'm, I'll turn this over to Brian for um, the LED streetlights. Thank you. Okay. So the uh, LED streetlights, uh, we've met with the uh, town managers and the town administrators at the, the beginning of this and kind of <coughs> talked about our ideas for that. Um, we have installed 25 watt LED lights um, in, the, in the four towns we serve. Uh, we use those to replace a 50 watt, 100 watt, and 250 watt uh, light. Technically, it's like a 70 watt equivalent. Uh, we figured we'd give that a shot. Um, it helps reduce our inventory, and if it works for all those fixtures, it can uh, save the town a little bit of extra money. Um, 
We also replaced 400 watt floodlights with a, a 93 watt fixture. Um, so we've gone over these locations with the town managers and town administrators of the four towns. And at the conclusion of the pilot, uh, we're looking for a, an LED full Im implementation uh, over the next three years starting fiscal year 2016. Can I ask a quick question? Sure. Uh, what's the comparable lumen output for those uh, replacements uh, compared <coughs> to the original? You know? Um, Are you losing lumens when you do the, the 25 watt is approximately equivalent to a 70 watt high pressure sodium. Okay. So it's kind of in between the 50 and the 100. Um, Redding has all three sizes, 50s, 100s, and the 250s. Most of the 250s are on the aluminum streetlight poles in the center area. Mm -hmm. um, so we did flip to the next side. We did uh, use some, replace some of those down on Haven Street, down by the tracks. There's, there's six of those down there. Um, figured it was worth a shot. They're fairly close together. If, if that works as a suitable replacement, it, it's a significant reduction in usage for the town. Uh, if not, we can easily take those down and use them elsewhere. So we figured, why not give it a shot? Do you think visually there's not a lot of detectable difference in terms of the light intensity when you put these up? Yeah, if, if, if you guys are happy with the output. Have you actually, sorry, Bob, go ahead. Um, and just to step in, um, the other three towns were probably quite reasonable, but I was pretty unreasonable. <laughs> I didn't want to publicize this, so I only wanted to you know, get out a press release and say what a wonderful thing. And it is a wonderful thing. Let's not tell anyone. Let's find out if yeah. they notice a difference. And I didn't get a single call, nor did anyone in the building or the police station. So that's the highest compliment you can get. <laughs> if we told anyone, I guarantee you we would have had calls, and you wouldn't really know the real honest answer. So people would have complained, you think? Or people would have oh, yeah. said it was really yeah. good? So you think the phone's going to ring well, tomorrow? We switched lights off It's too late. We've been living with it for months. <laughs> now but that we've been living with it for months, um, yeah. I'd be curious to actually have one second pass through it would be just to get a um, now that you know it's there what's your reaction kind of take because one is if I'd move something in the room and said what's different you probably wouldn't notice it and the other hand if I said I moved the painting do you mind you might have a different view so yeah <laughs> and these things are funny because the way that they look some people I'm not suggesting it's a, a single disagreeable vote wins the battle but uh, oftentimes there is some subjectivity as to whether it's uh, bright enough and so forth. Right. Particularly with these things, they don't. You had an illustration earlier. It's a whiter light. It's not a yellow light. It's cool, not warm. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. Uh, have you thought about doing that? Um, we are looking to get feedback. Um, to We've actually sent the police around afterwards. They're probably a good proxy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're out in the community all sure. the time, keeping their eye out at night, and mm -hmm. they said it was fine. Oh, good. 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 Excellent. Um, so the, the lights that we've replaced in, in town so far um, is uh, existing 50 watt lights on Cross Street. Uh, we replaced five lights there uh, on Main Street um, starting at summer going north. Uh, there was 100 watt lights there. We replaced uh, five of those. Uh, starting at summer going north. So down, down to about the uh, convenience store or so. Yeah. Um, and again, the 250 watt replacements down on on Haven Street. Uh, then you guys, uh, it's the first six lights coming up from uh, the train station. Yeah. Uh, and those kind of alternate back and forth on either side of the road. Uh, and then the 93 watt LED floodlights replace the 400 watt. It's a, about a 250 watt equivalent. Um, there's uh, four of those in town. One of them is in the, the front of the town hall parking lot out here. And then there's <coughs> three behind uh, CVS in the town parking lot. Um, some of the open items that we're looking for is uh, years ago, Reading shut off a bunch of street lights to save money um, well before my time. But uh, uh, there was a few of those that are still left off. So the police chief looked at those and made a determination that most of them were okay. Uh, there's three of them that we have to, to talk to the town about to figure out what we want to do with those because they're in underground subdivisions and we can't really just take them down. We could if we want to, but it, it is more work involved. So we've got to kind of work together on, on that. The Not the underground ones. The underground ones we want to 
talk to the town and figure out what you guys want to do. The existing ones that are shut off on, most of them are on Main Street. They shut off like every other light. Uh, right. The police chief looked at it and said, the lighting looks fine, so yeah. we'll just take them down. Right. So, yeah. so we're not getting nuisance calls saying you got to light out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Got it. I have a question, uh, with Bob, that it's probably for you. If there's, a, if there's a place where actually you do need a street light, how does that happen? So there's a spot on Prescott Street, which is going from the train station to where it's dead. Now, one is there's a light out, but another is I think even with that light, there's a dead spot, and I'm just wondering. Yeah, typically, is that these her. guys? <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think, I think it's actually more of a town thing. But typically what happens is you call out. either the DPW director. There's no light. Yeah. 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 You yeah. either call the DPW director or like a public safety officer, yeah. and then they'll talk to the town, and the town will send <laughs> us a letter saying either add a light here, or if there's a light out, you can call us and we'll come out and, and fix it. And in Reading, sometimes we own some of the lights, sometimes they own some of the lights. So well, and this is, I mean, literally this is on Prescott Street. It's yeah, right by the train station, and the, the sidewalk's not great on that side, and then you can't see, and that's where everybody parks, so. <laughs> so could you repeat that process to me? Is it something where um, RMLB will look at it, and then I'll um, make a recommendation if, to For you? instance, if I got a call, or yeah. DPW quite often gets calls, the first um, determination is who owns the light. If it's ours, we fix it. I've never got a call until Marcy just said, oh, <laughs> you need a light here, there isn't a light. Yeah. So that's an issue. It usually, um, what it, the it other might be fine once the light's back lit, but I don't, yeah. I think in looking around, it thought, looked like there was still going to be a, a dead spot. Yeah. Because the town pays for the energy, typically what would happen, that's why I'm wondering what mm -hmm. the policy is. Typically, what will happen is the arm will be we get a request, we'll have the nightman go out and kind of assess the safety of it. Sometimes you may need a second light because it's every other pole at a corner for safety. And if we feel like it could be justified, we would ask you permission if you would like to install another one and we would put it up. But if you involve the police to make that determination instead of us, then that's fine We've, too. As I say, I've never, I've never heard of a request in the 10 years I've been here. Lights out, sure, all the time. Right. But not, I need a light. I do light, yeah. yeah. Uh, other than back in the CPS <coughs> lot. Recently, we've had some conversations. I we know just fixed those, yeah. and I think we called. Yeah, and I think the and fixing is probably all they really needed, as opposed to can you please add some lights? Mm -hmm. But we'll find out. Yeah, yeah. those these lights are more more directional. They're dark, uh, dark sky compliant, so the floodlights are more directional. So we just had to adjust the floodlights back there, and it seemed to take okay. care of it. Now this might be skipping ahead in your presentation, but as part of this pilot program, do you have a cost benefit that you're tracking as well with it? Um, there, there is a cost savings. I'll look to the next slide here. So, I figured I was jumping ahead. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, again, we're looking at a full implementation, you know, assuming successful pilot over the next three years, with a total cost of about $3.3 million. Um, we did receive a LED grant from the DOER. Uh, it was for $250,000. $125,000 of that was specifically for municipal street lighting to be split between the four towns. Um, as far as savings, this is based on the complete switchover. Um, we're estimating that we're going to see approximately 60000 a year in maintenance savings, not having to change bulbs all the time. These have a, a life expectancy of about 25 years. And what's the realistic life expectancy of it? I think they're too new to tell. Okay, but I guess we'll see. Uh, <laughs> probably 50. Yeah, and that the 25 years isn't the light dying, that's when the, the level decreases right. below acceptable standards. Gotcha. Um, looking at saving over 2 million kilowatt hours a year, and the town should see about a 30% savings on their street lighting bill for, for these lights that are flat rated. Well, obviously doesn't why would it only be 30%? You're describing a 25, a 75% reduction in energy consumption. Uh, it's an estimate, but we also have to include the cost of the fixture in the rate. So the, oh. the fixtures are fairly expensive, so the you know it's the cost of the lights depreciated over the the 25 years, but that cost has to be covered in the rate. So, so the savings is a little bit less. You're covering 3.3 million through the rate. Is that correct? Yeah, in essence. Okay. 
And that 3.3 is for the four towns or for the just That's total for the four towns, yes. So the 30% is the savings after the recovery? Yes. You're depreciating the asset over however long to recover that. And that 3.3 is street lights, because if you look in the budget, it's 2.3 for street lights, and then what's also added in there is the um, private area lights and police that gets rented. In the, <coughs> the, the question actually um, that I have for you though is, the, where you put these lights in, do you, are you able to actually look at one light and say, I know what that um, does, I know what that costs, I know what that produces from a kilowatt standpoint, and then judge it against your pilot program with the new light to see the difference? We know is, that, what, is that not? We know the wattage that the old lights use, and we know the wattage that the new lights use. But you don't know the actual usage of that, yeah, that it, particular fixture? The, the rate's based on the light being on 4,000 hours a year. And so basically the wattage of the light times that 4,000 hours. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's a, an estimate that you know, we've done studies on and I think that's pretty common across the industry of, of what they use for estimating how many hours the light's on here. Okay. Where did you, where did you depreciate the 3.2 million? Is that the full 20 million? Uh, 25 years. Yeah, I think it was 25 years. Are you going to use the light for the boat? The, the use of life of all this. It's supposed to have a lifespan of 25 years. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. Okay. Where's where's that transfer to? Uh, where's 30 percent of our electric bill? We it's pay just about the street lights. Just the yeah, just the street lights. Two hundred thousand or so of street lights. That might include some traffic lights. I'm not sure. So, so a little bit. <coughs> Any other questions on the street lights? So are they dimmable? Uh. Not no. the standard ones that we bought. That's why when um, Brian said the 25 watt will go into the different uh, the wattages, if you wanted a one for one 50 watt for an equivalent, you'd buy a 19 watt. But the 19 watt is like custom and it would cost money. Yeah, so we're trying to standardize. Significantly yeah. more expensive. So um, <coughs> when, when Bob gives us the, uh, the email address for comments, mm -hmm. he never put it up. Um, in some t in some areas where we're putting uh, a 25 watt in for uh, a 250, you may say we want to bump that up. Uh, we want to start off on the conservative side and see if it's if it illuminates enough, and if not, then then we'll um, we'll increase that. So what kind of comments have you gotten from some of the other communities where you did? Publicize this. You haven't had any publicized. We didn't yet? publicize at all. We oh. decided not to put the pressure. So you, so you took Bob's idea. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I've got yeah, two comments. Comments. I think so that's far, a good idea. Um, both from Reading, uh, one person absolutely loves them, uh, and the other one didn't mind it, but it doesn't light up his yard as much, and that's part of these lights being more directional. There's the cutoff on the back is sharper. Mm -hmm. So there's less light pollution. Most people don't want the spillover in their yard. Right. This guy did. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now he has to get his own floodlights. Yes. <laughs> okay. So now we'll go into the the tree trimming. Um, Actually, before you go on, Brian, is um, any thought to doing something beyond this to the interior for the for your consumer base? It strikes me that this great success. You guys are a natural mouthpiece for. Promoting the use of I think this technology. Jane gets indoor. into that a little bit. Right. Right. Sure, um, thank you. But part of that uh, hundred the two hundred fifty thousand dollar grant that we got, the other half of it is for um, commercial and residential programs. Right. So the uh, tree trimming program. So we're looking at uh, altering the way our current program is a little bit, going to a, a three to five year cycle with three crews. Um, with an annual budget of about six hundred and forty thousand um, dollars, currently some of the areas that we're trimming, uh, we have to visit multiple times, so that, you know it's not being trimmed enough. Uh, the type of trimming isn't enough to meet the demand of the, the growth of the tree. Um, so we, we've met with the the DPW director and the tree warden to talk about this. We have a, a new tree con contract coming out, so we're looking at going to a directional method of the trimming, kind of directs the tree around the wires to lengthen the amount of time that we have, have before we have to get back out and do the same area over again. We're also looking at increasing the radius from a five foot cut to an eight foot cut. So it gives us a little more time before we have to go back and 
can hopefully save us some money on that. Uh, the, the new uh, tree company that we're, we're going out to bid for is going to have to have a master arborist on staff. He's going to put together an integrated vegetative ve vegetation management plan and a distribu yeah, excuse me, distribution vegetation management plan, which will, will be available to the tree warden of the town. And uh, also a hazardous tree removal plan. You know, hope to be more proactive on uh, trees that uh, are dead or dying that look like you know, they might may fall and impact our lines and be kind of proactive on that. Maybe a little off topic, but do you know if Comcast and Verizon have anywhere near a degree of concern about trees overgrowing their rights of way? And uh, I couldn't tell you if they do or not. No. Have you attempted to try to share some of the costs with those guys? I mean, it's the same pole, it's you're out there in the same trip. Yeah, take advantage of our umbrella trimming. Well, yeah, I, I, I could try to recoup some of those. If that, I'm serious. That is yeah, that's been mm -hmm. a 20 year fight with me, so it's, uh, <laughs> it's not going well. It's uh, generally um, it's the same with the pole testing that we're doing. Um, we'll end up testing their poles because we care if they fall over on our people. Yeah. And um, you know, the double poles with that ball in court, we'll be asking the selectmen to help us move that along. What did you call it? A ball in court? Well, in court, well, and it's the next person to make the transfer so you can get the double pull out. Um, so they're not cooperative? In, in, um, in some ways, they are. Should but they don't. Because they're getting a lot of money out of the, the residents they of the town. They certainly should have a bigger stake. Good luck. <laughs> it's a little bit of a different game. Yeah. We don't have as much say. Thank you, Brad. Yep, any other questions on that? Turn it over to Jane. Thank you for having us. Um, I only have a couple of slides here to talk about. Um, one of the one of the topics we're talking about is LED and um, efficiencies, and that's actually a reduction in our sales. So when we're reducing kilowatt hours, uh, that's a concern for us because that's eroding our revenue because that's how we collect our revenue. So one of the aspects that we're looking at is charging stations. Electric vehicles, if they really take off, that, pr that pr will produce um, an avenue for the RMLD to uh, increase our sales. Currently, uh, we're um, installing three dual charging stations, um, which has the capabilities for charging six cars at any one time um, at one of our commercial sites in Wilmington. Um, the, the, uh, it was analog devices that had the request However, they didn't want to own the charging station. So RMLD will own the charging stations, and these will be a pay per use. So employees who um, work there will be able to charge their electric car while they're working, swipe a credit card, um, will develop a rate for the, for, for the charging stations, um, which will be attractive for the customer. Um, in addition, uh, we applied to the DOER uh, for a grant that was available. Um, and we were successful in that grant and it paid for half the cost of the charging stations. Uh, that that uh, came up to a, a dollar amount of approximately $9,700 for those three stations. Um, the charging stations arrived today at the RMLD. Uh, the electrical contractor is picking them up and will be installing them tomorrow and so that project should be up and going within the next, um, by probably the uh, end of December, most likely, um, prior, uh, a little before that. So these are only available though for analog device Correct. employees, right? Correct. So However, <laughs> um, we also have um, a, a pilot rebate program for both our residential and our commercial customers. Mm -hmm. um, we are currently offering a rebate for the 50% of the cost of the charging station as well as the installation capped at $1,500 for charging. Uh, we have two residential customers in Reading who have actually taken advantage of this. There's someone on Mineral Street and on Warren Street who have the Chevy Volt and um, who have applied, have spoken with us, and we've uh, reimbursed them for those costs. Um, additionally, on the commercial side, there's, there may be more grants available. Um, we are working with another customer who's um, going to be installing them for their, uh, for their uh, employees in Wilmington. They're building a new building. And uh, we have contacted the DOR, and there still is grant money available. So if the town is interested in pursuing this, we'd be happy to work collaboratively with you. 
Uh, there's different ways we can structure it. Um, some businesses uh, use that as a marketing tool, so they tie it into their service and they encourage patrons with electric vehicles to use the charging stations while they uh, patronize either their restaurant, their storefront, or whatnot. So you can set it up uh, a couple of different ways and we'd be willing to work with um, any of our customers in doing that. Uh, the nice thing about the residential time of use, both uh, customers who have this are on the residential time of use, which means that they charge their car at night. Typically the driving habits will be changing where you won't be filling up your car on the way to work, you'll be plugging it in before you go to bed, charging it at night, and then just topping it off depending on how far you have to go or whatnot. Mm -hmm. um, so just the, um, it's very cost effective for customers on that rate. And uh, the rebate is on our, on our website, our www.rmlg.com. Back on the ADI, the analog devices, yep. what, what's the estimated, what do you think a ballpark number is for them to charge a vehicle? Um, it's probably gonna be under $2 a gallon. That's about a dollar. The, the, the pilot rate that we have, because we have to recover the cost of the charging rate, and currently we don't have a lot of usage data, so we've made some assumption in, um, assumptions in that. We figure that we'll, each car will charge on average uh, four and a half hours per day for each charging station. So based on that usage, we've developed a pilot rate, which will come out to be about 25 cents per kilowatt hour. Uh, the charging stations can take uh, a maximum draw of 7.2 kWs per hour. And so that's equivalent to a little under $2, $2 an hour. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, and to tie it to Mr. Arena's question earlier, um, part of our rebates that we're working with our commercial and municipal customer is, is related to lighting. Uh, we currently offer lighting rebates for the replacement of inefficient lighting. Uh, predominantly a lot of our commercial customers and municipalities are looking at LED lights internally. Um, so we currently have a program that will be capped at 50% of the cost or $10,000 depending on uh, the amount of savings. And for the municipalities, those are capped at 15, so you get a little extra um, being one of the four municipals that we service. Um, in addition to that, we have a commercial energy initiative program where we're looking at peak demand reduction programs. Um, as Colleen had mentioned before, our capacity and our transmission costs in the future are all driven by our summer and our monthly peaks. Um, in 2017-18, those are going to go from $3 a kilowatt month to $15 a kilowatt month for capacity. And so we're really trying to formulate our rebates and incentivize our customers to work collaboratively with us um, to reduce those peak demands. And we've um, incentivized our rebates um, to match that. Um, and the last project that we're working on is a voluntary demand management program. Uh, we're starting off with our commercials and our municipal customers, and we're getting them to sign up for a program where um, during the summer peak or during monthly peaks, we notify them through email we work with them to develop load shedding strategies, whether it's a building management system or actually facilities people going up and either raising temperatures or shutting down processes. Uh, and then we have a program where we'll determine the actual ki um, kilowatts that were reduced for that period. If it happens on a peak time, we share the savings with that customer. So currently, um, just as an example, our monthly capacity and transmission costs average around $10 per kilowatt month. We'll give the customer $5 per kilowatt month if they were to shed on that annual peak in each month and hit that peak. Um, so there's an economic savings to that. Um, we've actually met with the new facilities director in Redding, Kelly Colon, uh, uh, Cologne. And um, she's very excited to pro about the program. She's actually signed up and we're working collaboratively with her to determine those load shedding um, applications. Oh, in addition to load shedding, um, if, if a customers have emergency generators or generation behind the fence that they have, that's a much easier fix to do, although it, come, it goes hand in hand. If you have an emergency generator and it's permitted for that, you're not allowed to use that generator for peak shaving. So it's very imperative that we work collaboratively, look at the permitting of how that's permitting to determine if that is able to uh, participate in this program. So the commercial improvements, that all improves your base load. That'll, that'll reduce your, your base load. It's not the base load, it's more peak. Um, and like, as I mentioned earlier, lighting is probably base, um, but when we're looking at motors, HVAC, um, any kind of compressors, 
um, and, the, and the load shedding programs, those are all peak reductions. Um, and so we're just trying to flatten that. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions from the board? No, that's very informative. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. You know, listening, you know listening, to well, okay. listening to this sec session, it makes me think of the, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it badly, the uh, Reading's Climate. Oh, yeah, Climate Action. Climate action. Advisory. Thank you. Committee. Uh, this, this strikes me that there's a synergy here between the delivery of, of uh, energy and the introduction of new lighting. There's, there's got to be a vehicle there to take advantage of that group's initiatives and enthusiasm around the same topic. Uh, there's actually better. there's actually at least one member of RMLD who's on that climate yeah. advisory yeah committee. So oh. there is a tie already. Great. Let's see. Next on the agenda is uh, discussion on the uh, Birch Meadow Field Lighting uh, Project. So I see John Fudo in the room. John, um, sure. you want to come on up and walk us through this? Yeah, thank you. Quickly, just to, we just got out of a recreation committee meeting, so I'll be able to uh, frog our, some of my members come up and <laughs> listen to the discussion. So I'm going to introduce them really quick. Uh, Rich Hand is our current sitting chairman. Uh, Dan Foley is actually attending his first meeting tonight, um, so welcome to him. And uh, Frank Driscoll, who most of you, I think everyone knows. Um, so Bob had asked me to uh, just come tonight to initiate a conversation about the possibility of adding um, some lights down to the Birch Meadow Complex. We're currently working on the Birch Meadow Master Plan. We're making slow progress, but we're making some progress. Um, the one thing we know for sure is that um, we're going to eliminate areas down there. And it doesn't matter what's under it. It could be a lacrosse field. It could be a soccer field. It could be a baseball field. So we definitely know we want lights that will be, that's in the current plan, it will be in the next plan, it will be in probably any iteration of that plan. Um, so I, what I did was I approached um, with the concept that there could be some capital money available within the next 12 months. I approached a company called Musco. They're currently the outfit that uh, does our lights at the stadium field and uh, the tennis courts. And you've seen them, they're high, high professional, high quality lights. Uh, they're by far the industry leader. Um, they're as good as to let me know if a light bulb is out or fuses out, I get an email. And not only do I get an email, but they come out and they service them for us uh, under our 25 year contract with them. So um, the lights are expensive. I won't sit here and tell you that they're inexpensive, um, but this type of project could have so many rippled, rippled uh, benefits for this community. It, I can't even begin to tell you how great it could be. Um, so what I did was I asked Musco Lighting to uh, break up the area into several different locations that I felt we could benefit from either upgraded lights or new lights um, with the idea that we could expand our field space by basically illuminating some areas we could actually promote more activity. This past uh, fall we actually had to go out and rent uh, portable lights for one of our programs because it grew so big. We had to roll out uh, two banks of lights to make it work. Um, so what I did was I asked Musco Lighting to give me ballpark numbers on what I'd be looking at to illuminate all the areas. Um, so they were good enough to give me the breakdown, but they were also good enough to tell me that if you did more than one area, there would be some kind of an economies of scale discount. So I think what you're looking at is pretty uh, reflective on what we might be looking at as far as an expense to, to get this done. Um, so I looked at basically four different areas. Uh, the lighted softball field's the first one. Uh, most of you know that is the place where the men's softball team and the high uh, the men's mm -hmm. softball teams and the high school softball team play. Uh, yeah. Bob, that map back? Yeah, you want the map? Yeah, that map's probably a little bit better. Okay. So we can talk about the areas first. Uh, and I'm going to stand up. No, that faces down. You want to try to flip this <laughs> and breathe. No, that's okay. Um, it, unless anyone, if it's bothering anyone, <laughs> I can just talk through it. Uh, so this is the lightest softball field. We currently have poles all around there, wooden poles. Uh, we're talking um, four to six big tires going around to somewhat protect people, I guess. Uh, the light is right. not exactly great. Um, and that is used as our high school field and our main um, men's softball field. We, have, we also have two other softball fields 
um, that we also have high school practices on both those fields, youth practices on both of those fields. This area in the middle doubles as a practice football field and practice so so uh, so soccer field, I'm sorry, um, in the fall season. And then up here we have um, Turf 2, which is the uh, synthetic Turf 2 field, which is already lit um, with the same telephone poles and fan lights that we have. Um, and down here is Morton Field. Uh, Morton is the one of the 390 for baseball diamonds. Uh, we have in Reading, it's probably, I'd say, one of the top in the states now is that we've done all the work to it. New infield, new fence around, nice scoreboard. Um, so, and I'm sure you've heard Mr. Halsey say it, you've probably heard me say it. There's two simple ways we can expand our field space. We're landlocked. We can't really develop anymore. What we can do is we can illuminate uh, to add time at nighttime, and we can um, synthesize or synthetic our, our field to uh, increase playability. So those are the best ways to do that at this point. Um, adding lights to this field solved, so this field in particular solved a lot of um, scheduling issues for us. Currently we are we're on a three day on, three day, uh, two day off for men's softball and youth softball. We could very easily with lights just move all the men's stuff to 7.30 at night. Mm. And the youth could play before 7.30, it's just a very simple fix. So there's so many ripple impacts. Um, the aesthetics of the field, right now we have wires hanging everywhere. We have one pole that's on a 45 degree angle. Um, like I mentioned, tires are on the poles. Aesthetically, it just doesn't look real nice. It's not real representative of what running looks like. I think an upgrade is uh, long overdue. Often, we charge people with uh, turning the lights on and off themselves. It's all manual. I can't tell you how many times I've driven in and found the lights left on overnight. It's just a huge, huge waste of money. Um, with Musco lights, you can make a simple phone call, turn them on, turn them off. Um, now, that uh, spot in the middle, John, that's the place that we um, rolled in the temporaries. Yep, to be able to we've got a stanchion here program. and right down here. And it wasn't enough. It was adequate, but it wasn't enough. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, they're, 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 mean, they're it, temporary lights. Yeah, it did its job. It's never be the same as what's designed for uh, to make the space usable. Right. And a couple of quick questions. So you're going to reduce the number of poles and tires in, in the process of doing this? It should, yeah. Because what would ha I, and I don't have a drawing on it yet. My, the theory is, is we would need, right now we have six poles for the whole stadium field. Is it six or four? I think it's four. four. It's four. only four poles. Four. It's four. Four. Oh, I'm sorry, it's four poles. I'm uh, thinking the tennis courts at six. So it's four poles for the whole entire stadium field. Stadium field fits, fits almost in this footprint. Mm -hmm. So you're going to reduce the amount of poles you have. And I don't think we're going to have poles in the middle, Good. which would be nice. I don't have a drawing of it. Like I said, I have, I've only take this, taken this to the 10-yard line so far. That's fine. This is rough order magnitude mathematics. Yep. Um, at some point, you're going to need competitive quotes to make sure you get it. Even though you might prefer this output, yep. you're going to have to get a competitive number. Yep. We just finished up with RMLD. Bob, is there anything that RMLD can do here in terms of? No, no, no. I really haven't talked to them about it with you. Not really. I mean, no. we just got done with talking about street lighting, which I know it's different. Yeah. And But it might be that this is something that our own little group in-house in can do some of this well, work. One of the things that I, I think does apply from the previous discussion, uh, I know that they had commented on the fact that one of their calls was the new lights went in and suddenly there wasn't the spillover into the person's yeah. yard. Right. Um, now, mm -hmm. whether that was good or bad for that person, I guess they right. were maybe <laughs> using it as lights. But, uh, um, you know, I think, John, it would be important to speak to the technology because I, when I see the tennis court lights go on, yeah. the tennis courts light up and everything else so is black. And I can tell you, I can walk my dog up on Parkview Road and the uh, turf two lights are like right in your face. You've got so much light leakage. We well, actually get complaints from yeah. people leaving the stadium field out for football games that they can't see yeah. with the lights on because they're so well directed onto the field. Oh, I see. Um, yeah. that it, it's kind of an opposite, opposite. complaint that yeah. it's we don't have it's enough light leakage to it's too good. Um, <laughs> Musco is and I'm speaking of Musco because they're the ones that given us the quote, and that's my experience with them in town already. Um, I don't see this down the road being a, one of those not in my backyard issues because it's actually going to improve currently what we have. I, I, I think you are going to get people who compl who raise an issue because it's different, and yeah. you're going to coming out in front of it with a story around light leakage and directionality is going to pay a huge dividend. Sure, mm -hmm. lead with that. Um, John's talking about the technology. I, I support this. I mean, we can get better use of the fields not interrupt people that are neighbors, 
maybe even reduce some of the uh, <coughs> existing light leakage problems? Um, where's the money coming from? <laughs> your well, I think it's there, actually. Your, your witness. <laughs> John is always good at fundraising. I figured he'd I was told there was perhaps some capital money. I, I think if there was some capital money put towards this, if we fell short, I think we could do some um, some fundraising uh, in the community and probably find the difference. Does this include all the site work as well, or just the it lights? It includes turnkey, yeah. Just LED technology or something different? Uh, they didn't specify that. That's something we could specify uh, with Moscow. I'm not sure if they're doing LED yet. That's a 25 year yeah. light, so yeah. it may well be. Hmm. Yeah. I don't think it said in the specs. No, it didn't say. Yeah, these are very, very general. These were, uh, we have a presentation next week. Yeah. We're looking for hard numbers. I mean, you're going to. So, you know, I guess what. Um, one of the questions that comes back is that <coughs> relighting or properly lighting has been part of this plan, I think, for back seven or eight years. Sure. And it's, you know, uh, and I think I think town meeting has actually approved the original plan. Do I have that right? Town meeting has approved a capital plan that has that two and a half million right. bucks. Okay, got part it. Part of that is lighting. It's not as much as what's here, for sure. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just right. sections of it, but right. that's what. But, you know, and so I guess, um, so there is capital approval by town meeting for oh, yeah. a yeah. plan. Right. And that included, I think, because in looking at the material that, um, that we got in the packet originally, it said that there were going to be some changes to the original plan, which would probably free up some money that yeah. had originally been thought to be spent. Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I mean, I'm not sure that all the capital plan is sufficient, but I think that, you know, there are some changes to the plan that are going to significantly lower the original cost. Is it, do I have that right, John? Yeah, what I mentioned to the selectmen was that the idea of repointing the field, so to speak, yeah. was small benefit for large cost. Yeah, it was a and that, that was, that was the one thing the rec committee said, that's not necessarily a good way to spend your money. Right, yeah, there was a, there was a misconception about something on the last master plan, and in, somehow it wound up in the last iteration of it that we would flip, essentially, and, and the idea behind it was a, was a nice concept. It was to try to eliminate all the fencing along Birch Meadow Drive and to instead have trees there. So they said, let's flip all the fields and put this field here, this field here, and this field here. Conceptually, it works, but unless you move this field down into Castine's area, that's how it worked. When you took Castine out of the equation, it didn't work anymore. So for conservation those, purposes, for conservation that's not going to happen. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it kind of so defeats the almost the, the whole. Yeah. When Castine got taken off the table, this should have gone back to its original <clears throat> structure because it was a one point three million dollar cost just to move the field, and there yeah. wasn't a one point three million dollar. Wasn't that also the recharge area for the high school? I, I think the drainage goes to Castine now. Yes. To Castine, uh, you know, maybe I don't, part of that whole system. I don't know. So it's really. Or what area anyway. So I, I guess one of the other things, items of interest at least, I would think, is once <coughs> once this plan would become operational, then the users, one way or the other, the costs of of operation passes through, um, so that you don't you know. In other words, what's not being created. I, I think I understand this right. Um, you're not creating a you spend the capital, but you're not creating a, a new bill, right? Because that, that bill is a pass through. There, you know, in in other communities that have lit facilities, there's a there's a cost of doing business. In other words, if you know Babe Ruth wants to use it, they're going right. to pay for it. Whoever wants to use the field, if it's the men's softball, who I'm going to suspect they're going to continue to be yep. very heavy yep. users. And that's a cost of their doing business. Uh, yeah, and I think they are open to that. I think any organization would prefer better lighting down there. It's not great now. It's it's adequate, but it's what we're used to. I think once you've played under the better lighting, it's something that you don't want to go back to. Absolutely. And that's something that we've. And I'm glad you brought that up, John, because the recreation committee actually talked about the same thing. Is this isn't the cost that the town absorbs? Is is the usage cost? The usage costs are passed back along to the user. So. They do receive bills from us currently, but 
the current system is pretty imperfect because I have to do it on a percentage basis. Well, Pop Warner use it about 25% of the time, and you guys use it 10%, you guys use it 30%, and that's how they get doled out. The new There's stuff no really lets you operate more efficiently. You can yeah, actually tie it right system, up. The new system, we can charge, but we can turn on the lights for John Arena tonight and charge it to John Arena on an account. So now, is it is it reasonable to say that um, some of the because um, we heard about that tonight in a previous you know discussion that there's a cost of installation that has a usable life of 25 years we'll say so when the calculation of pass through costs go on um, essentially you know the town fronts the money and right. then recovers not only the cost of the electricity but you can recapitalize you recapitalize it and, and you know just bring it back in it, it depreciates it's passed through tied to the users and so where does the money come from that's a good question but yeah. I think that's you know ultimately where I mean there's capital money set aside but there's a system for recapture right so Absolutely. I mean it does become self-funding I think if I understand what I heard earlier from RMLB and what I would perceive <clears throat> be done here. Bob, Bob, that would be part of the business plan. We have a way of showing that offset in the capital plan. Well, I, I would say right now that's not how it's fully done. The operational yeah. cost, yes, but recapture capital. Recapture. No. Yeah. That would be something new. But we know There's from no the previous discussion. Yeah, well, they do it. Yeah, why not? Well, and by yeah. the way, the fields are going to be recapitalized. You've got fencing, you've got all the wear and tear, and eventually you've got to put a pile of money into that to, to rehabilitate Well, we've that. been fortunate enough that those yeah. that's come from private funding up till now, but, mm. you know, at a certain point, but you can't should. always rely right. on that. Right. Part um, of that is a Sharon a town accounting question because the Rector of Walden Fund has very limited things it can and can't do. It can't pay wages, for instance. It can pay right. expenses. Mm -hmm. It's never been asked to do very much in the area of capital yet. It may no. have, but right. so that's... Assuming we can cross that hurdle, then this option is available. Yep. Well, I, I know in talking to some neighboring towns, this is who have recently revitalized. You know, Melrose has just recently done this. Um, Pine Banks, I don't know if that's Malden or Melrose. It's or, Melrose. Yeah. Um, so they have actually, <coughs> in the creation of their their field rentals, they have they're they're recapturing their capital cost. I would imagine that's so minor relative to the cost of the well, time. relative way of the amount of usage that ends up, right. you know. I mean, right now people are clamoring for the space, and you can't, so it's not about what it costs, it's about yeah. what's available, and, you know. It's another 5% to recover the cost in 20 years yeah. to do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking about, John, doing some of the other improvements at the same time? Like, you know, I've been driving down uh, that, that road and had the softballs come flying over the uh, fence. <laughs> Is there any thoughts about putting that fencing up at the same time on the same poles? I hadn't, I hadn't thought of that, Frank. Years past, on, on one of the master plans, they, they talk, it was talked about putting up one of the nettings. Yeah, yeah. The that nets. we have done in other locations in town. The old green monster. But that hasn't been done yet. So that becomes a pretty inexpensive item too. I know no, Malden has done that, yeah. and they've done it. I mean, essentially, once the poles are up. The netting. You got the lift trucks. You got the guys. You got the poles. Yeah, the, another hour. That it would be a minor expense, and it's it is something that's an issue, for sure. That the balls are flying across the street. The the guys get bigger and stronger every year. The bats get better every year. There's no doubt that's a problem. So get better pitchers. Solve all the problems. Get rid of the dark. Let less fear. This looks great, John. Less fear. <laughs> any other questions from the board? Yeah. How does the parking impact? this if you want to develop this area uh, parking is a challenge in that, that part of town and my house is right at three o'clock on that on that diagram so there's a lot of there the, the end of Bancroft Avenue on the saying? Bancroft Avenue okay. this is the last house last house yeah, it's a good neighbor to the to just the identify fields, yourself actually. for the record oh, yeah. Justin thank you so that, that's a major concern and okay. uh, as as the summer summer rolls on, it, it just it just it just compounded, and more events means more loitering. Uh, it needs a higher police presence. Those are some factors we should consider. No tickets. Is parking addressed in the master plan? Well, I was going to say the last 
it's a little different this time because you've asked the recreation committee to do it. You're the road commissioners. So there'd be some question as to where would that discussion happen. It could either happen at the rec committee or with you. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but absolutely, all the neighbors are invited. It's public hearings, the whole nine yards. This, this master plan is going to take a solid year, at least, with full-time work. Uh, and, and the reason that, that it seemed to make sense for John to come and, and ask you about this or mention it to you tonight is <coughs> this really is independent of what the actual master plan says. Uh, unless you just abandon the section and said, no, I'm going to use that. You wouldn't be twice then. So, yeah, parking is clearly an issue. And, and <coughs> as the board knows, we've had discussions at a peripheral level station, their own parking issues they have at their schools, uh, the why we've talked to about parking, we've talked about reconfiguring uh, Arthur B. Lord's Road. So, you know, I prefer to look at the whole area as one problem, if you will, not just little sections. And that goes a little beyond the rec committee for sure, absolutely. That, that belongs here. To the degree this goes into the early evening hours, at a, at a minimum the school is largely out of session lots become available to try to take some of the pressure off that's not available during the day or during the afternoon right? yeah well the bigger issue is going to be and, and with all due respect I mean I clearly understand that the front of your home yeah. becomes a parking lot that's true uh, I mean and I and I've clearly seen that myself and as you know I often put my truck there so that people can't park and when I'm down there um, <laughs> so it's only cost me three tickets so far. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, I think the bigger issue is going to, when you start to open up the other softball fields, I mean, th that's the yeah. side that mm -hmm. is going to is going to have increased activity. So, yeah. for example, yeah. um, lights down on Morton Field, you can only play one game at a time. Right. Yeah. And so... so Yes. Down the road. Yep. Um, and you know, part of the direction is clearly when school is out of session, the utilization of those parking lots, you know, yep. follow that path that leads along the tennis courts <coughs> between the tennis courts and turf two, that takes you directly to two rather large parking lots, um, which need to be more, we need to do a better job of directing activities there um, so that the neighbors are you know so that the neighbors are get some relief and I and yeah. I clearly get that there is a X amount of parking places and they do get used pretty you know pretty heavily um, thanks Jack mr. Brown uh, if you go down to the engineer and they have the original plan back in the 1930s and nothing's changed just in the traffic problems were the same in 1930 so and parking was a problem in 19 John, just uh, before we close, I, I can remember vividly the discussions on, what were they called? Oh yeah, Amplified Sound. And uh, how there was a great debate about the extent and degree of interference with the neighborhood. And I get it's a sensitive topic. I, I, I don't think you can underestimate the same discussion here with either noise or light. Sure. And traffic. And, and getting out ahead of those with sure. proactive solutions. For example, one of the thoughts is, um, the lights that RMLD just talked about, to the degree you can, doing a demonstration or getting a video, it, it answers a lot of questions before they get asked. Do you have the capacity to go online and show that Musco field lit sure. up? This is a pretty interesting look. You oh. also have uh, at least some experience with different technology, but the tennis court lighting is probably not worked out as terribly as some people imagine. No, it's bright. I was going to say, I think we could, we could yeah, probably... Right. And, you know, that's something, that's something to consider, too. It's on now, and there's nobody there. I mean, yeah. it's paying for that. Is it till 9 o'clock, usually? Usually till 9, but yeah. it's there's, there hasn't been a soul down there in weeks. Any yeah. thoughts about making those on demand? or putting Yeah, just to say that, that same kind of technology where you could send an email and turn yeah. it on and off. Well, I was just thinking you put the Someday. big rotary cl clicking <laughs> switch, you know, the timer, like the... Uh, yeah. You're saying get, get an app for that? Is yeah. that what you're saying? Get an app for that. <laughs> or turkey timer. No, yeah. actually. I know in Lexington that's what they do. Lexington did a similar thing two years ago to their complex. They have a complex similar to Birch Meadow. 
Um, and, and I know that the various fields um, at Lexington are controlled by, literally, by cell phone. So whoever has the responsibility, you click you on know, one of those, I mean, it hits the button uh, and it goes off, off, which is what should happen over there. On the bottom left, can you hit control plus sign? It'll, it'll expand it. Bob, is that something that's part of the, uh, the master plan? Talk about the, the lights of all those cars, how they're um, used and regulated to, to help you know, should offset costs. Uh, what, what's the deal with tennis courts now? I thought they did have remote access from Kansas or something. From Iowa. Iowa. Yeah, they can. We can turn them on. I can use this website to actually turn them on and off. Yeah. Uh, okay. But I can also phone in. And it, is it weather sensitive? It's not weather sensitive. But, but, that, but that's available. And, and that's a it's a pay per use um, site, right? The tennis courts. Uh, technically, no. Or you have a season in which you buy a seasonal pass to participate. Okay. But it's a very very small. It's it's late May to early September. So there's no way of telling when somebody that's paid wants to get on there and play it. No. Not right now. So that um, that upper left hand picture is four baseball fields. That's pretty sharp. <coughs> and it, you'll see where the lighting stops. Yeah, you'll see the, the bottom the left bottom is the more impressive is, one. Yeah, you can yeah, really, you can see. really see basketball courts and a pool. Yeah. Well, they've got eight baseball diamonds and uh, tennis courts and a pool. And, yeah. and you know, the technology of the lighting. You know, as you visit places that have taken advantage of it, is I, you literally go into blackness. Yep. You step off of these athletic fields. Just yeah. I, you can't underestimate the, the fear and concern on neighbors that won't necessarily understand sure. this. So getting out sure. of the There's a lot of process to go through before this happens, right. and I think a conversation with the neighbors is is uh, definitely in order. Good. Any other questions? Yeah, you know, the one thing that strikes me is something like this, and it's actually pretty impressive to see it there. To see it live is even better, I'm sure. Um, it, it does actually raise a little bit of a concern where, like you said, as soon as you step off the light, you're into complete darkness. Mm -hmm. So now you have a lot of groups that are conjugating around in, that, in those areas. Is there some kind of like low-level lighting um, uh, for the outskirts of, of the fields that, that we're looking into or maybe we should be looking into from a safety concern? You could do parking lot lights, something like we like Not even like big, you know, yeah. Something that's like a well, you have high, those actually. High tower light if you think about Birch Meadow, that exists right now, because that's you know all every everything's ringed with you know street light kind of things. Yeah, I, I mean, I don't want to add more light to you know to <laughs> to you. an issue for the neighbors, but right. you know something from a safety standpoint, we just want to make sure that we we're looking at as well. Great, thank you very much. Oh, Bob, excuse me. Thanks very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very Thanks. much. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. All right. Next, we have a uh, request to remove restriction on the sale of NIPS for Liquor Junction, one general way. There's somebody here representing Liquor Junction. Why don't you come up and introduce yourselves? Yeah, my name is Jessica. Hang on, Jess. Yeah, what, what do we empty the room here so we can hear what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't we take a two minute break? Two minute break. Good idea. <laughs>
Bill, it's getting scary. I'm starting to see those patterns now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm starting to see those patterns. <laughs> Genetic acid infection. There should always be another one of those. That's true. All right, why don't we take up again? So um, thank you very much for coming out. And uh, we have before us a request to remove the restriction from the sale of NIFs. Do you have any prepared material you wanted to go through? Remind me, the, is Liquor Junction the sole, the, the, um, so the only ones that have this restriction? What was the origin of that restriction? It was actually offered by one or two owners ago that had no need for it. So we just offered it maybe as part of the deal if I want to be in this location. And by the way, I don't envision doing this. Um, he presented his operation as, I'll, I'll pick a number, I don't remember, 85% internet based sales. I remember that now. Um, so that he had no use for this. So he just offered it up to the board without the board asking. The concession. And they said, okay. <coughs> so there was, in the history, there was no particular reason that it no was, I mean, it wasn't excluded for cause or? I, I don't remember, Paula. Was there ever a discussion in any other situation of this clause? Yeah, I think this was just, it was offered and it was accepted. Yeah. Nothing more complicated than that. What's the history then with uh, the operation of Liquor Junction relative to either? Uh, it's been no different than the others. It's been good. I patronize the store. It's very well run. Uh, talk to your manager there. <laughs> Told him who I was. Any other questions from board? How has their uh, violation history been? Not clean. I think they're clean. I don't think I can remember any of them. Everybody Everybody's gets Everybody's tips <laughs> trained, right? Yes. Okay. Tips trained for nips. You might notice this board's taking a taking a particular view to that this year. So. Mm -hmm. so how long have you folks owned the, owned the, this store? Um, it's been about six months. Oh, so you're uh, fairly new owners. Yeah, yeah. first yeah. year, yeah. Yeah, okay. Do you have experience someplace else? Is that yeah. said for Yeah, here? we have another store. Oh, okay. Yeah, in New Hampshire. see no objection to this. Uh, I, the, I, the police weighed in in any sense in opposing um, or supporting this? I don't think they've ever been asked. I, okay. okay. Yeah, I mean, my take on this is if you have a license to sell liquor and you're yeah. doing it appropriately, why wouldn't one license be yeah. more limited than the other? I don't yeah. see exactly. that. That's the biggest thing, especially where a good reason for that. Where everybody, where all the other um, stores are able to sell it, this the one. Ex this is the one ex store that we have that doesn't. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, you know that that to me is is pretty simple. Okay. Um, when you look at it from that standpoint, you shouldn't be hurting one business over over others. Okay, if there's no other comment, I'll be happy to offer a motion. Please. Move the Board of Selectmen remove the restriction on sale of NIPS on the Liquor Junction liquor license. Second. Second. John, second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, raise your hand. Five zero zero. Okay. Thank you very much. Coming in. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks for coming. Uh, next, we have a. Uh, You're done. You're done. <laughs> you can stay with the whole evening. They want to hear about the next. They want to hear about the minute, or about, about, about the opening <laughs> extension too. So. <laughs> liquor stores in town have to ask the selectmen's permission to open at 10. And by the way, you can't say no, and it doesn't matter if you say no, because they're already open at 10. But they have to be formally on the record as having gone to the selectmen for 10 a.m. So it's one of the more bizarre things. It's a I've super efficient seen. process, huh? Yeah. <laughs> Remind me again. It's a streamlined <laughs> permit, I guess. It's already horse sound <laughs> like anything. Uh, yeah. Remind me again how, how it is that they're open already. Because that's part of the state law. As soon as they want to be open, they can be open. 
to the Central But they have to let us know at no, some point. No, it says they have to have made the request, right? It but it doesn't say we have to have approved it. It just it says they had to have made the request. Somebody's Once they make the request, <laughs> then they're okay. So, okay. It's hard so to we're feeling very important in yes. this process. Oh, yes. <laughs> so can I have my Super have an hour back? Well, so I have to yeah. sign yeah. before. Oh, take good. Out your rubber this is just a once and done vote. Is it annual? Yeah, I think it's once, and then yeah, it just goes along. Then it so just goes with the annual yeah. license, uh, right? Everyone, okay. um, Everyone except the council members. Yeah, one of them didn't. Okay. Council members. Now, was this the one where where originally this came about because restaurants wanted to, to serve Bloody Marys and mimosas starting at 10 a.m. Probably. Yeah. And then they said, "Oh, well, you can't you can't let the liquor stores not get in on that if you have a vote." Yeah. I do move that the Board of Selection approve the change in Sunday hours for liquor stores to open at 10 o'clock a.m. for Uses Liquors, I'm sorry, Uses Reading Liquors, Inc., DBA, Uses Reading Liquors, 345 Main Street, Athens Liquors, Inc., DBA Square Liquors, 11 High Street, Jay and Ricky, Inc., DBA Ricky's Liquor, 214 Main Street, Kajal and Kevin, LLC, DBA Liquor Junction, 128 Marketplace Shopping Center, 1 General Way, and Brooks Brew and Fine Wines, LLC, DBA, The Wine Shop, and more, 676 Main Street. Okay, do I have a second? Second. Kevin will second the motion. Any discussion? Does it matter? No. <laughs> so all those in favor, raise your hand. 500. Thank you. Ooh, geez. Uh, For the next several sets, um, there's no objection by the police. On the renewals, we're just doing the uh, all alcoholic club licenses tonight. And then the next page. Oh, and then the next page is more. Pages. Oh, there's more. Oops. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Do we need to have Dan read the whole? Yeah. Are we able to dispense with the reading? Uh, yeah. That's up to the moderator. <laughs> And we, we've had this discussion about Ricky's that uh, town council advises us that we are not really empowered to they not have serve their penalty. Uh, we must all move on. I think it's important for us to speak on the, on I mean, that on yeah. the record. I, mean, yes. mm -hmm. I think most of us have heard um, since Ricky's has reopened right. that um, there was there's been citizen questions, you know, why that would have reopened um, prior to the suspension that we imposed. And I just think it's important to say out loud for the benefit of those present and for anybody on TV that, and Bob, you'll correct me where mm -hmm. I don't have this right, we imposed a 90-day right. suspension in addition to the four-day suspension that was pending for a total of 94 days. Um, and that was appealed mm -hmm. uh, through the State Commission. And the State Commission didn't exactly uphold you know where we were. However, uh, they suspended the suspension, kind of a probationary period, for a period uh, of 40 days was carried over for two years, right. pending good behavior. Um, so it's my understanding that 50 of the days plus four, plus four, four served, so served. 54 of the days that we imposed suspensions were served. Right that the additional 40 days that we imposed were were put into a hiatus for a two-year probationary period. Um, should there be another violation, those um, automatically come back in, in addition yeah. to number yeah. one, in addition to whatever else we decide. And in addition to that, the ADCC ruling was the most severe of any that has happened. So, so far, the yeah. fact that they <clears throat> yes. said you're going to stand with 50 days was much more than they have yeah. far outside, given them far, a, far a much outside more of any of a penalty than any other other town. And has. I think so part of that that's important too is that they actually um, looked at it as three offenses. Mm -hmm. So even though two of them occurred in the same night, they upholded it as hard as. A Three third offense, offense. and in the next this offense, yes, view. it was would, would, would be a fourth and offense. And again, just to correct one, Mr. The ABCC cannot overturn the ruling of the board, but, their but rec their they made a strong recommendation. And town council advised us that to not adhere to that would would probably pr present an adverse condition should we go to court. Right, and they would probably overturn the whole thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and so we, we don't want that to happen. And, and especially to Marcy's point, where it was a a um, 
I don't know, monumental is the right term, um, Land, ruling. Certainly yeah. landmark. Notable. Certainly landmark, yeah. So, um, ruling on the amount of days that, that yeah, were so held in and the, um, and the 40 days uh, pending as well. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the, uh, you know, I don't think it was, this creates an opportunity for Ricky's Liquors right. mm -hmm. to, to straighten up and fly right. Um, and and it provides a heavy, heavy incentive to do so. And a, an automatic penalty if they don't. And so right. it's, it, you know, it's my hope. I just, I can only speak for myself. It's my hope that Ricky's Liquors is able to, you know, maintain, you know, a, a legal operation throughout their probationary period and, you know, and, and marches down the road. Um, and it sounds like that that's what their goal is and, you know, I hope that that happens. They are a Reading business, and I'd like to see them thrive sure. um, as long as they do it the way they're supposed to. We don't take any particular uh, pleasure with doing that. This is a requirement of um, overseeing the administration of licenses. I do think there's a secondary uh, reality, which is that the other um, uh, liquor stores in town now recognize, I believe, mm -hmm. that this has been set as a precedent. So it has, I think, a a value in just alerting them and making them aware of the level to which this board is willing to right. go when circumstances demand it. Okay, again, well, I think I there's a clear, excuse me, Dan, go yeah. ahead. You go ahead. I would encourage staff to, and I think uh, Chief Cormier said they would take a look at our guidelines in view of this because they are very light compared to what we did. I, I hope those will be toughened up uh, once appropriate discussions are held. I, yeah, and I was going to, that was part of where I was going. I do think we need to rethink the current guidelines that we are operating under. I don't think that's a topic necessarily for tonight. No, no, no. no. But I, I think that they do need to be, you know, um, they, they do need to reflect the sense of who we are as the board that governs, you know, the liquor licenses. Um, and that, and I do think a clear message that we take the legality of the way that they use their license very seriously. Okay. Procedural question, Mr. Chairman, Bob, too. Uh, is it all right if I just read the name of the entity here so the public knows who we're licensing and instead of all the verbiage? I think that's fine. Okay, well, that's what I'll do. Makes sense. It, it will, the whole motion is as in front of us here. Uh, all right, let's do the, uh, we're going to do the club liquor licenses first. Move that the Board of Selectmen approve the all alcoholic club liquor licenses for Reading Overseas Veterans, Federal Brook Gulf Court. Uh, the Knights of Columbus and American Legion Post 62 for a term expiring December 31st, 2015, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment for the town manager or his designee. I have a second. 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 Any discussion? All those in favor? And I will do the uh, package stores. Uh, move that the Board of Selectmen approve the all alcoholic package store liquor licenses for uses Reading Liquors, Square Liquors, Ricky's Liquor, The Wine Shop and More, Liquor Junction, Pample Moose for a term expiring December 31st, 2015. Subject to the following conditions, all bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. I have a second. I see the second the motion and the discussion. All those in favor? Five zero. And now the restaurants. Move the board of selectmen approve the all alcoholic restaurant liquor licenses for Mandarin Reading, Cafe Capri, Venetian Moon Restaurant, Chili's Grill and Bar, Fuddruckers, Bertucci's Italian Restaurant, Longhorn Steakhouse, Ristorante Pavarotti, Grumpy Doyle's, Oyez, Sam's Bistro, Portland Pie Company, and Munratty Tavern, the term expiring December 31st, 2015, subject to the following conditions. All bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Mr. Alti seconds the motion. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. And finally, uh, the single wine and malt liquor license uh, we have. Move the Board of Selectmen approve the wine and malt liquor license for Palatet, 
Debt in the Suam, doing business as Bangkok Spice Thai Restaurant, 76 mm -hmm. Haven Street. For a term expiring December 31st, 2015, subject to the following conditions, all bylaws, rules, and regulations of the Town of Reading and of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts shall be followed and subject to a satisfactory inspection of the establishment by the town manager or his designee. Okay, Mr. Sexton seconds the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Yeah. Um, does it? Does it appear any others? Yes. So regarding uh, the FY15 classification. Yeah. Yeah. Page 5, F1, page 19. Thank you. Please take notice that the Board of Selectmen of the Town of Reading will hold a public hearing on November 18th, 2014 at 9 o'clock p.m. in the Selectmen's Meeting Room, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, on approving the FY15 classification plan. A copy of the proposed document regarding this topic is available in the Town Manager's Office, 16 Lowell Street, Reading, Massachusetts, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday. 7:30 a.m. to 5:30 p.m. and Tuesday from 7:30 a.m. to 7 o'clock p.m. and is attached to the hearing notice on the website at www.readingma.gov. All interested parties are invited to attend the hearing or may submit their comments in writing or by email prior to 6 p.m. on November 18, 2014. Thank you, Bob. Tonight on uh, your packets, pages 20, 21, and 22, have some background. Um, before I get into those pages, let me just give the board, some of you which are new, a little background. Um, when I began as, as town manager, and it seemed like 30 years ago, uh, <laughs> June of 2013, um, I left my old position vacant. Um, I did that purposely while we rearranged and reorganized town government, if you will, with the idea that for six months it's going to be vacant. We then went to a town meeting did some rearranging, uh, reclassified that empty position um, to break it into a couple parts. The finance director piece went to the town accountant, and now that department looks different. And this was the additional piece, and I called the town manager of administrative services. Mm -hmm. uh, at the time, we had a very strong internal candidate for the position, but instead he became assistant town manager of another organization. Um, once that happened, um, we had a series of retirements and hires that suddenly hit, and the, the most significant retire in that process was our HR administrator. Mm -hmm. So it was just no practical way in the next six months to put this in front of other positions that were full and had to remain full, such as DPW right. supervisors. Mm -hmm. um, at that point, and now, now where that gets us to last summer, I jumped into the charter committee, and, and Steve was just there a little while ago. And I, I learned some things that the Charter Committee had been discussing during its first nine months when I hadn't been part of it that I was a little surprised at. And one of the things um, I was quite pleased to see in a way, and found out later if I, it wasn't for the reason I thought, that they were insisting that the ombudsman role in the Charter be delegated by the town manager to another employee. And I thought, isn't that nice? They think I'm overworked. Well, that wasn't the reason at all. <laughs> <laughs> so the reason was, uh, and, and Bill can back this up, um, it's almost like a check and balance. They yeah. want the voice of the people to be able to go yell at the town manager. <laughs> and the town manager then has to listen to not only the voice at the other end of the phone, but a colleague. Mm -hmm. And so, and I understood that, and that, and that made sense. And I guess, the the what's that? The right next to Frank. Right in there. Yeah. It'll be well marked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it says. <laughs> um, so that that made me start to realize, all right, what I had in mind for this job needs to change at least slightly. And it, you know, there's a, there's a couple reasons for the change. Um, one is to, as you can see on page 20, the job description uh, very clearly in the very first point says to act as ombudsman, and it just cuts and pastes right out of the charter. So that's that first section. I don't think it's appropriate to have that position called assistant town manager anymore if it's supposed to be an advocate for the people. Because that assistant town manager sounds like, well, you're part of the same administration, right. you're part of the same problem that's not listening to me. Mm -hmm. um, so I like the idea of sort of separating that title. And it's no more complicated than that. We have uh, two assistant town manager positions funded in the budget. They're both called assistant town manager. 
one's community services, one's administrative services. I'm just asking you to change the title to administrative services director, which is about as simple and plain as I can come up with. And if you look at the page 22 of tonight, um, there it is as a picture. I'm just saying leave the assistant town manager alone because there's still one person in that role and just um, you know split out that title into a new title, administrative services director. And the reason I didn't want to wait for the pay and classification, which could well be in front of you in December, is I really want to advertise for this position now. Um, it's gone long enough. I, I've gone too long. I, I believe that. Yeah. Now, Bob, is this position the one that will um, <coughs> take on the website as, yes. as the communications person and make sure Absolutely. that we've got something that people can use and right. interface with? Excellent. Yeah, they're, they're in charge of the technology, the town clerk, and something called operations. Mm -hmm. So it, a, a lot of the discussion you had in the Reading 2020 and the goals mm -hmm. and all that, this falls right in their lap. Okay. And I've done the mm -hmm. best I can, which is obviously not very good. Because but there's not enough of you. Right, exactly. Not, not so not this will be a really important hire, and I do want to ask the board, especially if one of you that's available during the day can assist in the hiring process, that would be really helpful. Thank you. I'm happy to, Jan. Either one of us. Either one of us or both of us. Or if you guys insist. We'll throw around. Any other questions? No, I, no, I think I would just say that, that you know, same. contrary to your last statement, I think you've done a spectacular job given that you've had two jobs to deal with right. for an extended two period plus, of time. Right? <laughs> yeah, I, you know, it's stunning to me that, I mean, I understand why you've waited this long. It's, you know, I'm glad we're not waiting any longer. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm glad we're getting it. Now we've got to get it filled. Right. Public comment. Any public comment? Oh, that's right. I can have oh. them go to, see, them go to <laughs> see them. Unless you put him for the position. I didn't folks. think of that. <laughs> no, do you really think that that will happen? <laughs> well, I guess that's why I really didn't think of it. He still knows the way unless it changes. I will move the book. Move the Motion You're still welcome. I'm going to first move to close the hearing uh, on the approval of the FY15 classification plan. Seconded by Mr. Sexton. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Move the Board of Selectmen to approve the amendment to the FY15 classification plan by removing the, quote, assistant town manager slash administrative services, unquote, position and adding the, quote, administrative services director, unquote, position. And Nancy seconds the motion. Any discussion? All those in favor? Five zero. Mm -hmm. um, well, we have next some proposed charter changes. We all got a copy of the uh, yes charter as it exists over the weekend. Right. Um, and I have two versions. I have the bold and cross out if you want to really see what's changed. Um, just to backtrack a little. Um, the board has gone over this in the past, but I think John Arena was absent, mm -hmm. and there were some issues that were raised that were, were desired. There to have was a full at least board. one thing that we did need to, to take up, take up again. And yeah. Um. So I don't know how you want to proceed through this, where you've already been through it. So uh, I, I had a couple of general things mm -hmm. that I'm I'm wondering how to how to put forward. So one is that um, <coughs> there's a bunch of of places within here where we have these things like under 2.4 amended November 24th right. 2014 I'm wondering if we can put those at the end similar to the way that the current zoning bylaw works so that there's a table of all the amendments okay. and you don't have to sort of read around yeah. those particularly now while we're redoing this this is a, an ideal time to kind of well to say it differently when do they disappear when does it when does it become I've wondered about that myself because when uh, you delete a section sense, do you leave the it footnote makes sense in? for me to, to uh, that you would delete them now as you're redoing it but yeah. if you can't do that then you mm. i would move them to yeah. the end where it's being recodified so that's a breadcrumb to tell you something changed right right but have, have you guys discussed this at all before do you I have a preference okay. yeah uh, it, i i would prefer that we get rid of them well, well i'll ask frankly, town council, so if town council streamline it get rid of as many as we can and put it in a better format so it doesn't interrupt if we could put it yeah, in yeah, or to say it differently point. if they don't serve any obvious purpose yeah. you know, appendix bob not, not as maybe obvious. Yeah. Or just at the end. Yeah, yeah something, yeah, get it off the, so the main body. There are two other general things that I have around this. Uh, one is that um, right now the definitions are in 
section eight, but they're such right. not at the end. If we could put them at the end or at the, you know, someplace where they're, the they're yeah. easy to find, makes sense to me. Yeah. They're kind of in the middle of section eight, which yeah. doesn't, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And the other one's a much bigger one, which is that right now um, we have this thing in, and I know that it's been clarified a little bit, but if you have seven days or less, it's business days. If it's more than seven days, it's regular days. I went through and did a search. It's very hard to actually tell. I would, I would move that we put business days for anything that is less than seven or up to seven so that it's very clear to anyone that's reading that section they don't have to go back and try and figure out the timing of it. Or we would take that out. Um, and the, there's at least one place where I think it's very confusing. So there's one spot where it says, um, uh, it, it's, it has to do with the public, the budget. And it's um, not less than seven days, nor more than 15 days. So the first one is in business days, and the second one is in oh, calendar days. Yeah. The first one, actually, when you do seven days, it could be up to 12 or 13 because of the timing of it, right? If you've got, if you start on a Thursday, you've got a holiday on Monday. So you've got Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday. Now you go into the next week, you like go through two different weekends. So I would recommend that we either look at those places where we have seven days and figure out, does it need to be business days? Does it need to be some set number of days that's more than seven? The point is you want it to be explicit. And I want it to reference. be explicit and not something where you have to kind of figure it out and know this little secret code that's bare, that is in there, but it's hard mm -hmm. to find. Well, I can tell you first coming on to town meeting that it took me at least two years to figure that out. <laughs> I suspect mm -hmm. I'm not alone, so right. making it explicit is a way of kind of simplifying it for... Absolutely. Well, and, and in this one place here, um, this is really interesting because it's, um, it's, it's, it's related to the budget and the school committee budget, and a public hearing has to happen not less than seven days nor more than 15 days following such publication, which just seems strange. Why don't you just say at least six, 15 days after you have the hearing? Like, why? what's the magic in saying it's seven days after and... <laughs> oh, I see. But they don't want a public hearing a shotgun immediately after so that nobody's had a chance to digest. It just it just seems odd to me. But, um, that, that one example is awkward because the seven and the 15 become squished. Becomes more, it together. becomes more like 12 and 15, which exactly. is what it does. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, um, I have no problem with making it explicit. Well, what I thought is it, if you had to leave it in there, I'd make it eight days you to 15. You could say calendar days in that section. Eight to, eight to 15 calendar days, and just yeah. then it's more than seven, and it's, you know. So, so the idea would be that the term days means days the town hall is open and well, equals business, business days. Eight, five. Oh. This, this was an issue business we discussed quite a lot. Yes. The business days are businesses, but town halls closed on Fridays. So we, don't, we don't use the term business day anymore in the charter. We, oh, we took it out. Okay. But if you look under 8.5, behind yeah. it. We do use it. Um, it shouldn't, there them. shouldn't be a phrase business day anywhere in the charter anymore. Now oh, this, right. since, but since I'm, what I'm met, saying is that doesn't make sense, though, to okay. do that. Well, that's, yeah, that's different. <laughs> now it's just, what does a day mean? And this is, you can read it. You know, if it's seven oh, so days or less, it means days the town the hall's, hall's open. open which, right. which is a, like a business day. Okay. I mean, you can, what you can do is change so it so you, you define. See anything in and the actually, charter, I think it says business days. I think days we, took, we took all that out. Took that out. And took but we out. took it out okay. since I showed you the last version. We've oh, met since. Okay. Yeah. I would say that this is th this is still not resolved. Then, it, in whatever way it needs to be resolved, it just needs to be clear to people because th this is not inherently obvious. Peter always felt strongly, for clarity's sake, that it was best served to have the seven or less, eight or more in one section. And then it became obvious to somebody, I think to him, because he was so schooled in it. But to anyone else, it was mm. so not no. obvious. Yeah. I personally don't see the reason why you don't use calendar days throughout. I would just use calendar days throughout mm. and just figure out what, how many calendar days do you want to allow for right, this? Because exactly. seven, seven, so if you seven days yep. town hall is there are open I'm good can with that. be 11 days. There are a couple of topics, such yeah. as when you need to get to town hall. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. And it doesn't work. Right. <laughs> This more re I know what we've discussed in the last couple months, but uh, I think this this thing should stay the way it is. Quite the way it is now, yeah. yeah. Because when you start taking referendums, which I've done several of, uh, it does get confusing. Yeah, I will. I think well, it's I, I still going to be confusing yeah, if you're doing I referendums. If, if it, I'm not it, mistaken, I think it still goes back to state law on referendums. That's why. 
So what, what was the point to have it as um, seven or less or, or seven or more? Um, there's a lot of things in the charter and in state law where seven is the key. Seven days is just what's <coughs> written. So is seven so days the charter actual is defining, calendar days now? Well, it doesn't say in state law. So in the charter, it, you assume it's calendar by default. Mm -hmm. So the so charter is trying to be more lenient. Calendar. Right. Okay. When the thing says seven, we're trying to cut you all a break and that's say, and fair. only when town halls open right. do those days. Fact, we almost but see, that, and that's the problem. And that's the problem is it, it, it works for Mr. Brown because he knows this very well. It does not work for your average citizen who does not know the in and out minutia of our charter. And most people won't. And so you're going to wind up, you know, people aren't going to understand. It's actually more lenient to them. Than they might expect. Yeah, and so maybe and the confusion won't really be quite as great. Well, but there's a really number of different places where we have seven day business day days, and they're not just related to that thing. Can, can you cite a few? Yeah. The seven day there's clause is littered whole, throughout the charter. There's a whole series of them here. So it's um, town meeting membership, town meeting sessions, vacancies, there's establishments a, I, I of boards and committees, referendum procedures, removal procedures, finance, recall procedures. Removal of employee boards. So it's, it's, it's just, you know, several of them. And, and the issue is some portion of those seven days we can't change because mm -hmm. it's what state law right. says. Some of them we can. Mm -hmm. I'm sure something to do with the school committee and the yep. budget, we can change a yep. lot. So the question is whether you want to cut people a break on the things we can't change mm -hmm. by saying, hard luck, it's just seven calendar days. That's the real issue. And the charter has attempted to cut that break, albeit cause confusion. I would, ju I would just say, you know, it, it's... Um, could, I, could I make a compromise? Yeah. Could we, could we just reference, maybe this is too, too difficult, but reference anywhere with an asterisk that if a day is referenced, you go, for those that are reading, go back and check this other section so you know what a day is. That would be easy. Enough. With the price of an asterisk every oh, time the word yeah. day is... That, so that sounds yeah. good. I, I Qualified that paragraph. We can yeah. just good. after each seven d seven seven days mm -hmm. parentheses less, C seven section or less. whatever right. Right. seven yeah. or less yeah, the yeah I think yeah I think that's fine right. okay yeah. at least they have something they can follow right, right. there's no which is what, what you're getting. right there's no uh, otherwise uh, Mr Brown knows it because he has it up here but right most otherwise, people don't have otherwise that somebody's calling Bob and saying so when the, can I do this the <laughs> years of experience this so. week was last week next week. So are we empowered to do this? Is this a suggestion? This is a su this this suggestion. suggestion. Board of Selectmen to to input the to the charter right. committee. Yeah, I'm taking right. notes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, thank you. Thank depending you. on whether we have town meeting with next Monday or meeting next well. Monday. Had it been your committee appointed, you would have had the power. You do not have a meeting next Monday. Yes, we the do. Charter committee. Yes, we do. Okay. What? Well, just a possibly. Just a person. One, uh, one, one section I read that I... I still trip over a section 4.14, which is other boards and committees, um, and that is there's a new right by mm -hmm. any of the elected boards or committees to establish and appoint or dissolve yeah. mm -hmm. boards or committees underneath them for a specific purpose. I, I don't know if that's the definition of an ad hoc committee or not. If it were, I would assume it would say ad hoc committee. We decided, mostly I decided, the town council said it was okay, to stop calling them all these different terms like standing and Call it a board or a committee. Is it subject? So you can, as as the authority appointing it, you can call it whatever you want. You can call it ad hoc if you like that. In doing so, is that so created board subject to the same open meeting laws and yes, local yes. meeting mm -hmm. as, yep. as the parent? Yes, and further, uh, it doesn't say this, but it's implied. If you create a board or committee, you can create a sunset clause, and town council highly advises you to. Can you make that mandatory? Sh should that not um, be in here? I'm not sure if you can make it in the mandatory. We didn't ask him. Well, it, it, so se it seems counterintuitive to make it that it's a possibility and not to at least illuminate the reader that that's a possibility. Yeah. I, I would say uh, leave it as is because you've got like department has many subcommittees. Right. And they may not want a sunset clause on it. We're not they obligating have. them to have one, but mm. we should let them know that one is possible in this. Well, uh. I think that'd be by communication. Yeah, Let them run their so business too. down so there, you guys. And I, I think it's one thing to have elected boards be setting up a bunch of other committees, but mm -hmm. if you have appointed boards and committees, we already have an awful lot of boards and committees. Well, if you suddenly have they them... They can't do it. Oh, no, just said elected. It's, it's only elected. Only elected. Okay. We did talk about that. Okay. Right. 
Oh, yeah. So when when it's re when it's oh, written this way. Okay. Yes. Because, okay. Because yeah, that would be silos. way too much. Have the committee on committees. Okay. On committees. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. yeah. I'd like to bring up the uh, uh, establishing uh, warrant article issue regarding the number of uh, members of board of selectmen that, that should be allowed to do that. Remember where that is, Bill. Uh, Two, two, uh, something? Four minutes. And I'll, two or more. Two or more. Yeah. Let me make the arguments on both sides and suggest what might be a compromise here. Uh, the two or more allows a minority to perhaps bring a controversial issue that the full board wouldn't support. And I, I respect that that was probably the intent of the framers. Uh, my argument has always been that when the term board of selectmen, just board of selectmen appears under a warrant article. It, it to a certain degree implies sponsorship of the article and support of the article. Not necessarily means that, but I think it is interpreted that way by town meeting. Uh, I have seen warrant articles, and Bill, you probably remember this in the past, uh, with the words by courtesy yes. underneath. Yes. Is there a way of putting that concept together with this two or more? Because that would that satisfy term? my concern. What does that term mm -hmm. mean? It means by, we did it by courtesy On behalf of to the other two. Because you might have been right. doing it on behalf right. of right. citizens, mm -hmm. for instance, right. or suggesting mm -hmm. the party that did the, the petition for the January. Um, <coughs> I've started putting in the warrant report some explanation of that, but yours is a better idea. Board of Selectmen by courtesy. I think the better answer is for A, however many members need to support it, that should just say Board of Selectmen. But if you're doing it for any one of these other reasons, it should say courtesy of the Board. I'm not following. What you're if you saying. look under 213A, yeah. that's something that two or more, or maybe we're going to change that, of you want to bring an article. Mm. So that's truly a Board of Selectmen sponsored article. Actually, let me take Wouldn't that be a majority? It's a minority. How can it See, be well, yeah, well, I, I don't know why we would not have a majority. Why, why do you want to keep can the just, two? If I yeah. can just say something. What's your perspective? I, I think yeah. that right now, the way that you're thinking of this is that the warrant belongs to the Board of Selectmen. And I would argue that the no. warrant belongs to town meeting. I, I, I don't argue that. And so things that. get yeah. put on that. And the Board of Selectmen may be obligated to put things on there, but that doesn't necessarily that's mean that they are sponsoring it. And so, well, I would think anything we're ob obligated to put on, we're prepared but to speak. But for A, why wouldn't you say sponsored by select person A and select person B? Or worse yeah, just put the names well, of you the could people. Certainly, that you could certainly do that under A if it's not unanimous. You could say, uh, you know, give some explanation. Are, are we empowered to do that uh, by the language of the charter? Or is that just yeah, up to the, just the person writing up the warrant? Yeah. Um, so under B, C, D, and E, you could go to a different format and explain more thoroughly. It's not just board of selectmen. Yeah. And the other option is you can always make a report that says we put this on the warrant well, in, you know, and, 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 and we actually have if, voted and we are not in favor of it. Yeah, if town so. council says to me, no, you can't do that, that's crazy. It just has to say Board of Selectmen. The very first sentence under the background can say, well, Board of Selectmen put this on the warrant yeah. because the Conservation Commission asked them. That's a backup, but I mean, yeah. it'd be much but more straightforward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let's debate the wisdom of the two or more versus a majority, which actually just strike A and then B would cover that. Well, in both cases, you have less than a unanimous. You may have a, what, what is the, uh, the term, uh, concurring opinion? You may have a, di a group that, actually, it's a divergent opinion. You might have three people that say yes, two that say no, but you I guess that is a majority, so that goes on by the board. But I'd very much like to know if it's if it's two, that who they are, separate and distinct from the backup, just, just for clarity's sake. A lot of times you just get the warrant. I don't necessarily get all the backup. And I so think that's a legal question that only Ray can say, yeah, you can do it or no, you can't. Uh, Bill, do you remember the origin of why that went in there back in 84, or whatever it was? <laughs> you know, I don't know. I don't, I don't either. Either. Yeah, I, I know that. Yeah. By, by courtesy, right? Courtesy anyway, so do you, do you want to continue arguing the four and against or are you done with that? Um, well, I'd, I'd like us to take a position on whether we're happy keeping that or should we change either strike it or change it to three or more. I'm still leaning toward the three or more unless there's a compelling reason. Yeah. I, I have just a question. It seems as though everything else, and I'm new to this, so Everything that we vote on rises or falls based on the majority. It strikes me that that's, that's what democracy is about. Why is it here that a minority
can act on behalf of the board. I think the answer is in D through E, and that is you'd be compelled. That's a whole different thing. But you'd be compelled to do it anyway, even though you were, it, it, you don't have the sink or swim right with any of the others. This is, but this is not actually taking a vote. This is saying we want Correct. to send something to town meeting to take a vote. And so what I would say is you've got two members of the board who have been duly elected by the town to represent the town, and two of them feel strongly enough to, to send it to town meeting. Well, I, that's if all. That, if that's well, I mean, technically, shouldn't it be one? Yeah, that's, that's right where I was going. I mean, following yeah. that yeah. logic, yeah. Yeah. any yeah. any one of us should be able to. I mean, that, that should be actually the, the argument. Do we want to have it as one or, or three? Mm. Does we want to have a majority or, or simple just you know, the courtesy of one, one, is one, is one elected official? Yeah, yeah, no, no filter, filter at all. Filter at all, right. It's any, anyone's pet peeve ends up on the warrant. And so two well, I wouldn't right. be in favor of one. Five, five guarantees, <laughs> something of significance has got, uh, and that's that's one reason to make a distinction between the entire board versus a minority. Is, is this, is the board, the, the minority members are arguing here, you two guys primarily, I think, that this is to pr preserve the interests of, of a sub-segment of the board to bring something important forward, or is it that you no. want to help somebody get a petition article on? I think it's more we're the conduit to get it on the warrant. Yeah. If there are nine other conduit, reasons why they get it on, conduit yeah. from whom? Another it, board, another person. It could be any of the above. But, but they, are, but people have that petition route, and I don't like to see us serving that role, per se. I think it's a lot cleaner if we allow the petition process to take. I see your place. point. See, now your point is there are plenty of other ways. There are plenty of other ways. Minority right. views to make their way in the warrant. We just saw that a very mm -hmm. nicely constructed warrant article was in fact presented uh, and hundred signatures. And it's, it only takes 10 signatures of the regular and subsequent I see your point. Yeah, 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 I mean, I, I, don't, I see that diminishes the value of having the two. I, I, I agree with you. The only argument that, you know, you may want to take into consideration, uh, I know part of the, the process is making sure that the process is just that, that there's, there's a public avenue and process for this. But is there any avenue that there may need to be, um, I, I hate to say it again, but an 11th hour decision that, that, that could, that this clause could actually play a role in, where the other process can't play out, example, and we need to get it done. If there, if there really is a, or a, something, you know, a public safety concern, or something. I can't think of a scenario right now, and that's what I'm trying to say. Is there a scenario that we, we're not thinking of under which uh, A would be necessary I, or I'm, needed for the town? Yeah. I'm just hesitant to make it more restrictive, personally, than, than it is today. I mean, we're essentially saying we're gonna we're gonna restrict something more than it is today. Um, I feel like you, you you seemed like you you had well, something to say. My only comment is, <coughs> excuse me, the way this is worded and has been practiced, um, any of those B, C, D, and E could come up to you at 7:59 when the warrant closes at eight and say, here it is. Now, if it's a petition, the town clerk has had to say it's in good right. form. Right. Mm -hmm. One would hope if it's a petition or any other method, the town council has weighed in, but we don't always know that. So it's nice to have an avenue where the selectmen can step in and make it a more public process. Um, presumably other boards do that if they're coming to you, so that shouldn't be a problem. But if residents are doing it, they have no way to do it in public. So whether that means one of you should allow that public process to happen, or three, that's up to you. But petitioned articles to me are troubling because they haven't gone through a public process. That is my right. main Now, you, you can do that after the fact. You have to close it on the warrant, as this one, you have no right. choice. And all of a sudden, you need to then say, okay, now we need to fit it into our schedule before town meeting of uh, getting this agenda item, noticing a public hearing, or whether we call it that or not. It's cleaner if the petition folks can just go through you through a different process. And not, they, can, the process. they can go through A. And, it, and if they have one of your sympathies and you have the right to do it, then it'll be an agenda item, it'll be discussed in public. Well, so can we stipulate that if that happens that there be a wording on the warrant that says this is by courtesy? That's you? that's the question for counsel as yeah. to how... And that, that how is the only condition under which I'm for keeping this the that, way it is. That completely promise. makes sense to me. I, I, I mean, I, if we say it's gonna be a majority, I'm okay. I'm okay with that. I just this is one of those where I think I don't know of a compelling reason why we have to change it. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, yeah, I don't think what happened in closing our fall town meeting ward is a very good example. We almost didn't close the ward mm -hmm. if we'd had one more abstention that night. 
You don't so have a small how, town meeting. So how would this have helped? That's the if it were three or more, then that would not have gone on the warrant. It would have been rejected summarily right there. Well, and none of theoretically them. that's true, but practically speaking, you had three votes in favor of it. And by the way, you just got a petition, so you got out done anyway. So the fact well, it's not about being that's out fine. done. That's the right way to Yeah, there's nothing no, wrong with that at all. That's not our guess petition. It's a matter of putting the label of board of selectmen on it. Is right. Problem, right. From a practical right. standpoint, what happened here, what happened that causes this discussion is that, you know, we had one vote, we had two votes abstaining. We had two votes in favor. To close the warrant. And we had right. one vote that voted in favor so that we would have a, ta a, a, fall, town a fall town meeting. meeting. That, but that was. Because he was the one that understood the parliamentary right. fix that we had put ourselves mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. um, and which. And I'm not quite sure what the remedy would be since you're supposed to have a town meeting. Uh, but that doesn't have the. Um, what well, would be without warrants? It'd be like the 10 a.m. A liquor store. <laughs> it would have been a warrantless. So one town reason. Meeting. One reason to make it three. Let me give you a good reason, please. If you just have it, is in a case where an unpopular warrant is put forth, that you don't put yourself in that jeopardy position again. It's the only case I can think of. It guarantees that you have three in favor. It's something of that has not gone through the proper process. Right. No. If it's not, if it doesn't come to, if it comes to us by B through E, it's by. We have to close. Well, I, one of the things I find interesting, you know, to your point, Kevin, is that I'm yet to find anything that, other than this, that you can do the in the eleventh hour, that everything else has a proscribed yeah. amount of days, <laughs> and, and it's all seven. It's all you know, very cloud in a cloudy way, very clear. I mean, it's right. it's it's regulated. Okay. This particular thing that happened. It's right here. It's this word. It's not defined. Yeah. And I don't remember if we discussed that. Town meeting submitted. All right. It would seem to me that. It means by the time we close it, I would. You would want to have. Let's just pick a number. Two weeks in advance, so town council can look at it. Yeah, I mean, so for example, we chose not to. Even though we were asked by a number of citizens to take a position on the the new historic district, yeah. Yeah. we were asked to take that position. We said no, because we felt like we wanted to hear from the public before we were willing to do that. Now, I thought that was a proper way for us to go about that. And then, but that's you know, not placing an order. That's not placing. That's just they, voting they on that's it. That's just voting on it, which is it's different. different. So you have to separate the two. I know this. I know this. They're all over the time, but they are. There's different. a principle involved here. But you're you're marrying the two is the problem. Yeah. I think it's. I if think I'm, the if principle I'm not marries them. Favor of it, I'm not going to vote for the warrant, and that's that's potentially a problem. I think. Well, I come back to. I will say this that. Fortunately, we were able to, before the, before that particular warrant in question, um, before we were in town meeting, we took a vote on it because we yep. put it there, mm -hmm. yep. okay? Right. And that vote was zero five zero, if I remember yep. correct. We voted against it, yep. right? Okay. The problem with eleventh hour stuff is, you know. It sends, I think it sends a, a weird message. Well, you're causing town meeting to get prepared for an issue that we're not even prepared to present to them. And, and I don't blame them for getting upset with that because they spend their time reading the warrant report and figuring out how they're going to vote. Actually, A okay. and B are right. in conflict with each other. B says any elected or appointed town board or committee, which would have to be a majority in that board. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. But A doesn't yeah. have to no, be a majority. Selectmen have well, a well, privilege that the other town has. Right. But the logic behind B, I guess, is it's the will of the majority. And right. I, if I yes. understand it, mm -hmm. we're going to sponsor a bill. I get the point around three, and any of us could take could exercise B and go get the signature. Right. Yeah. So oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I mean, you know, this is not a hill I want to die on. Right. No. Um, <laughs> well, I, don't, I don't either. But I, but I will tell you, it's just <laughs> from a principle not, standpoint. I, want, yeah. I, d I just wanted to have the discussion uh, with all five of us. But I want the right. board to take a position on what it is. So. I, I'm going to move to recommend that the board, uh, that the, the board still can recommend to the charter committee we strike uh, 213A. In its entirety? In its, it's entirety. entirety? Yeah, because then it's covered, B, under, B, then it's covered it. under B. Right. Oh, I see what you're saying. Because we're an yeah. elected board, so. 
or, or you can change it to three or more. Okay. Uh, whichever. No, it's better to strike. Well, you better strike, strike it if you're gonna if, if that's I, if that's you what know, you're thinking. I, I do hear what Marcy's saying though. I mean, <laughs> I, look, like I said, this is not a hill I'm ready to die you on. Accept it's, my motion. Or, uh, do I have a, anyone except for the second on the motion? Um, Dan's proposing to strike A, so it would make us subject to a majority of the board. I'll second the motion. Okay, we have a second. Any further discussion? I think we yeah. got it. Okay. Yes. Okay. I, I, I have further discussion. Well, yeah, I was going to say, then, then discussion. <laughs> Happy to second it. Motion on the floor. Okay. Yeah. The what? The B contest. The B contest last night. Oh. <laughs> the bird. Well. I do have a break with you for closing it before we had a chance to close that out because we were ready to get done with it. <laughs> Any further discussion, Dan? Yeah, I, you know, th there's a side of me that wants the citizens to always be able to find their way. And so have we closed that door or have we just turned two into three? Have we turned A into a three number? We would, two, we would essentially be turning two into three for this board. I could use Mr. Brown's statement, which is, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Well, <laughs> and it's we, been like this for however Marcy, long. Marcy, we almost <laughs> broke something big time back in our COVID. <laughs> Bill, with all due respect. Actually, um, <laughs> the 10 days before uh, an annual or subsequent sub town meeting, we did, in fact, do that back in the last charter change that we had. At that time, you had to have 100 signatures, to citizen right. signatures mm -hmm. anyway. And my argument at that time was, well, if we're going to have a town meeting, why put the town, yeah. everybody through it in town clerk's time to certify 100 signatures when you're going to have a town meeting? Right. If it wasn't a... So why is the special different? Why is that 100? Because... Because then anybody could get a special going, right? Yeah. Right. We know we're going to have these two every year. You know you're going to have these right. two yeah. anyway. That's not a big deal. And, and yeah, my, so my argument is that stop taxing that makes sense. Having special yeah. election. You can't cause a special election by having an article. That goes on the next. No, I know. I know. Oh, okay. But yeah. so, so, so actually, that doesn't make any sense no. then. No, it that's doesn't. A, that doesn't make at any that sense. Time no, that just makes it harder. At that time, they had to have 100 signatures to get it on the. Uh, <laughs> no, we're losing track here. Yeah. Well, um, guys, it's getting late, so why don't we stay on the motion? The, the, my, only, my only point in, in regards to it, and, and I, I, I definitely understand where you're saying it, it comes from, you know, it does give an air of uh, support from the Board of Selectmen. Um, is this something that we can, I don't know if I'm making an amendment to your proposal. <laughs> um, is this something that we can wait until we talk to town council to see if we can reword it and have that left in there? So that, so that, it, that we no, can, it can be specific so that this is not this is not the board putting this forward. This is the board, you know, whatever. What, what was the term you used earlier? By courtesy. By courtesy. Yeah. Where you're just making a recommendation. Your vote can be completely illogical as anything that wants. <laughs> yeah, it looks like, like it's going right that way. In order to make it really clear. <laughs> um, I'm willing if to, we can't do you know, this, then we want to do this. Okay. I'm willing to lay it on the table until we have such a ruling. Sure. Then I will withdraw it. Well, I just don't, I, I just don't want us to, to make a recommendation that may have some unintended yeah, consequences. Yeah. That's, uh, that's uh, all. I'd say it's 99% likely we do not have another meeting before the language will be finalized by the Charter Committee. Mm -hmm. So whatever so verbal well, so you know, oh. assistance you want to give them, including town council, I'll give. So if council well, we're not voting to we're change not voting it. We're voting to, to recommend. recommend. Just You're to voting recommend. to recommend. So I can They're reflect your conversation. Anyway. And I can ask council, you know, can we fiddle around with the Board of Selectmen language and say as, you know, as a courtesy for whatever we can't, maybe you want to then address something here, but I'm not clear on what you're going to do. I understand. So the two threads that we've described is B already describes us in the majority, A right. describes us in the minority, right. subject only to noting that it's uh, courtesy. Miss, well, no, it's Mr. X and Ms. Miss Y or select person. Or, 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 Name them someone else. or two name selectmen can put it on. Yeah. I have, then, I'm, then I'm fine with it. Well, my view is that satisfies the identification of those two individuals separate from the board as a whole. I think the one gap is this timely thought. If I play back the warrant article that we just uh, had back on, I think on the 28th, that wasn't observed. That was literally an 11th hour yeah. Hail yes. Mary. Mm -hmm. Correct. That's yep. what broke. 
We're yeah. trying to fix it by doing this. But, but the time needs to broke. If we'd have had another week, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, quite frankly, I think the, the thing that broke, though, is saying I'm going to vote down the warrant if I don't agree with all the articles that we put uh, on there. True. Which is different than, and that's a, that's more of a, a board of selectmen. Yeah, that was more of a thing. point of order. But, but, but with so more time, we would have recognized the, the problem that that created. It wasn't as vivid at the time to all. Uh, maybe now. I'm just saying longer term, yeah. though, with other people. But, I agree. You know, I mean, Any way to make time. And, make and I know John said <laughs> Um, I just, I never vote my rights away, ever. And I have certain rights here as a selectman. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, I think I would vote against your motion again. Okay. Just because, you know, if I have a right, I, you know, I don't give them away. I mean, I, you know, I, I it, maybe it's just a philosophical, you know, it's a philosophical outlook that I have. I do think that we have to be very attentive to all subjects timely. I, and I think we, you know, we, we, we probably, this particular group of five people on this board, given the circumstances, might have handled that last thing that's causing all this discussion differently. Mm -hmm. right. yeah. um, and, and so right. that being the case, I, I I'm going to trust that rather than legislate away a, a, a right that I currently have as an elected Can I selector. offer a substitute motion which will the one I made? Um, I would leave A as uh, worded and add, add <coughs> some language to the effect that. Uh, Name selectman? No. Uh, let's see. But not, like to, so not, not to take the place of BCDA. In other words, if there's some valid reason. Something. I don't want to see it short circuiting any of those other things. I'm not sure. I'm I don't want to follow it back. Uh, there's I, always an in other words, if there, there's another pathway for another board to vote it on, they should do so. If there's a petition pathway, that should be followed instead of the two. That any 100 or more, uh, that should be followed. For any other person or entity, that should be followed. In other words, if this is an issue purely of concern to the board, to select and feel very strongly respecting John's argument about rights. I don't want to see this short circuiting other things. I think that's hard to enforce. I, I think that would be hard to know Bob? necessarily. Mm -hmm. I think one of the advantages of having it the way it is is, uh, you know, imagine a board that you've appointed that's gone rogue and they won't put an article on and mm -hmm. you want them to. You might want to keep that option out there. Kind of like the 60% rule. And the way this is worded now, all subjects timely, because of A, that means only two of you have to agree that it was timely, however it was delivered. And that's fine. That's just that's just a fact. Rather than debate the meaning of the word timely, is there a vehicle to specify some minimum time? The way it's put in there now, it's up to your discretion as board, but only two of you. <laughs> so if you want to, it'd be more restrictive if a number goes in there as opposed to your, your decision. Well, which would uh, also, are, which would also lessen. Up to, the, up to the charter committees. Well, you can <laughs> certainly lay out as a policy for all, anyone in B, C, D, and E. These are our rules. If we don't see something 40 days in advance, 10 days in advance, whatever you like, we're just not going to do it. I, the, the frustrating thing about this last vote, there was nothing about that discussion that had to be done urgent at all. No, it was, it was not. manufactured urgency. It was. And so I'm trying to think now, is there a case where putting a nominal mm -hmm. delay suggested delay, pick a number 24 hours, seven days. I think you can have that as a board of selection policy. Yeah, I think it doesn't, it doesn't need to be, to be doesn't in the charter. It doesn't have to be in the charter. Yeah. We can determine right. what timely is as a board of selection. All right, so. All right let's, mm -hmm. well, let's, let's not, well, you didn't accept now, there's some anyway, times so. when state law is going to trump you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I, I did like the, the two parts. I know we're going late here. Uh, I did like the two parts as, as far as the two or more named board of selection. Um, that's about the only change I, I, I would like make that. Would, would be I, good because then, then it removes the, you know, the part that it's the entire board and yeah. no, these two members have yeah, decided. It change any of the rights that are currently. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Is that an acceptable thing with town council? Right. And we'll see. We'll make the recommendation. We'll make so, it. All right. Dan, you have a motion on the floor to strike A. Any further discussion? Uh, well, I withdrew it. <laughs> you withdrew it. <laughs> <laughs> the secondary. You, you did withdraw. Okay. So uh, I think you want to withdraw the second secondary, or are you going to? Yeah. Okay. Going on so I think this devolves to we just want to recommend that we. 
note A differently than two or more named members yeah. of the board of selectmen. And, and, yeah. and as far that. as D goes, do we want to ask them to revisit that and say why do we need a hundred here? I think you should. I don't Rather, you know, so shouldn't, I don't it be, see, shouldn't it be shouldn't 10? It just no, because we don't want no. them calling a special town meeting. Just well, they can't. Well, they can't. Can't. They can't have to call just a town meeting. meeting. Yeah. Special town they can't meeting. can't call it just by having a petition. The next scheduled town meeting. You schedule town meeting. We're just making it harder. Technically, if for there is no to January it town meeting. I, I wouldn't mess with that. I think Bill gave the reason. What was the? I, I missed that, Bill. What was the reason? I think the subsequent town meeting at one time was clarified as a special town meeting. It was called a special town meeting. And I think when the argument yeah. was to me that we're holding a town meeting by uh, charter anyways, right. why make it more difficult, right. not only for the citizens, but for town clerk? She has to verify all the signatures. But why do we want to do this with a special town meeting and make it more difficult for her? Yeah. I, I have no idea what yeah. that point. I mean, now, now it seems like that's an obsolete, uh, because we have, the, we have subsequent anyways, if that's an obsolete. Well, I don't know. Yeah, that's suggested maybe by state law. Yeah. And you don't have to worry about that. You make whatever recommendation you want. That's been yeah. there forever, Kevin. Yes. It's been there for 50 years. But if it's made, been made obsolete by the subsequent town meeting, no, not, no special, longer being a special. Special requiring a has been there for many, many, many months. Right, but that was before subsequent town meeting was there. That's what Bill's saying. The reason why they did it that way is because subsequent used to be called a special town meeting. I was say well, now if we're having it anyways, well, it, and that was the purpose to have the hundred on there is for that what is now the subsequent, which they were calling the special. Doesn't hasn't it no, outlived special, its usefulness? Not not subsequent. It's not the only special we have. We're having we had a special in September. We have no, but a month. <laughs> you would want that to have a hundred signatures, right? But but right. But, it's coming from a citizen. But the thing is, you're missing what what Bob's saying. So Bob is saying, you don't just because you have a petition that has a hundred signatures on it does not mean you have to call a special meeting. The special meeting is up to us to determine when we're going to have, That's right? That's true. So, I know that. So right. if you're, go you're going to just say at the next town meeting we have, be it special, subsequent, right. or annual, right. you get 10 shall signatures. Be it, 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 wait a minute. Shell place on such warrants. The next schedule. The next, schedule. next schedule. schedule. Put this on the next train. It doesn't tell you say that. Right, right there. <laughs> so it, it's we're putting an extra bar barrier on okay, okay. just for special town meetings and not for the um, annual or subsequent and it doesn't yeah, it, it, it doesn't actually all it does is take up town clerk's time and i'm just looking to say i'm i'm, I'm not saying one way or the other i'm just wondering all right if you go along me on a <laughs> well i'm just i'm just wondering why we have it is it something why? that we want to look at it is there um, is there a good reason barrier? for it all right i, I don't know so does that change, i'm not saying there's a good reason to not or have it i just want to no. Have it discussed. All, the it, charter has this, that'd be all be subsequent to this, but it would change your attention. No, no. What I'm saying. What is it would have changed is the the gun bylaw that, that that's being proposed for this for January. They only would have needed well, not 10. Only 10. Right. Or What's the AG they sign? or they could have waited until the annual town meeting, right. right? With 10. Right. But either either way. Gets yeah, I'm, I mean, I'm just curious to look at that to say, is that something that's needed now? Is it? Is, is there a reason why it's in there? Specific one, and, and two, have we outlived that reason? And do we need it? Maybe not. Could so we recommend that the charter committee look at this and? And that's so. all I was looking to do. Yeah. I think yeah. Maybe I wasn't saying take a position it, on it. We just, just say, say, can the charter committee look at that bill? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> just to, Could you talk about it? I'd be curious it? just to determine, you know. The, the background. And at <laughs> <laughs> right. I'd be curious just to see the background it's, of it and, and if it's something that's I'm always willing needed. To listen to that. it's, uh, it's Can we get a sign to the board that we could put the word named in a, in a two or more named members of the board? I thought we already decided yeah, that. Okay. Yep. That's, that's, that's already been decided. Are there any other comments in the charter? That, no. Or the there, there actually were some others based on what Bob had talked about. So there was one thing that was removing from the Board of Selectmen something about having the executive powers of the town. Um, um, maybe that, that got, got put back that in That got again? clarified so it clearly states okay. you are the executive. Okay. Oh. Yeah, okay. It was kind of implied, but okay. it needed to be stated. But it wasn't stated. All right. And there is a role for the board in the review of uh, the budget now that in consultation with the – I think that went in a long time ago. I think that – yeah, that went in a while ago. I had a question. Does a town meeting member need to live in the precinct they are representing or does mm. to be a registered, it looks like you have to be a registered voter to be in town meeting. 
Yes. To be elected, you have to be a registered voter. Yes. But it doesn't actually say you have to live there. So if you went and got 10 signatures from a different precinct, different and precinct. they said, yes, we're happy to have you, because quite frankly, we have throughout town a lot of precincts that don't have enough people. And then we have others where no one can get uh, in. People, no. uh, I don't we cannot do that. Yeah, I don't think well, we Doug, do where that. does it uh, say that? I uh, wasn't United able to States find Supreme, that. United States Supreme Court, one, one man, one vote okay. district. Unlike Congress, right, where they can uh, live, yeah. live outside their district, like Nikki well, like Saugus lives in. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was settled many Charles years Stout. ago, Madison. Okay. Uh, the United States Supreme Court. And I think it started out being <coughs> a great deal of that area. Okay. One man, one vote, Scott. One somewhat related topic, just you reminded me to discuss quickly. Um, the way it is now, a non resident can be appointed to a right. board or committee by the selectmen. You right. weren't here for that. Not wait a minute, oh. a non-registered resident, I thought you Non-resident. Non-resident. A non-resident? Can be. Why? And there are. Why? That's, Why it, doesn't, do that? it doesn't limit volunteer boards, volunteer appointments to be residents or residents. You can imagine when you have a subject matter expert. I mean, you might have well, a business yeah. and then You might have yeah, this, business you know, the, yeah. Yeah. talking about the cultural aspect that you were talking about earlier, where you have other businesses, you know, mm -hmm. from other, other that's towns. A, that's a two-edged sword, because you could get a five yeah. Mm -hmm. We've had this You could. Of at a recent board where a member has moved out of town and some other member of the board said, well, doesn't this member have to resign? He's like, no. Mm -hmm. Well, bring it to the selectmen. They, this, this shouldn't do. It's like, no, it's perfectly fine. But you ought to discuss it if you don't agree. Mm -hmm. That's true. the way it is. It's, it's been a little, uh, you know, mm -hmm. since any board can have an associate member, and I presume it has no limit on the number of people that can just show up and participate, it's unclear to me why you'd ever have a formalized membership on a a committee where that I don't know why you'd be a voting member. I agree with that. Uh, yeah, as a non-resident, non -resident, non-resident. I don't think it makes sense. Don't understand why you would when you could have an associate member. We're not walling off that participation in any other way. This is purely to have a vote, and they can be an associate. So is it right well, now that they can? Uh, associates are limited. If you look at this four fifteen, you have to have. Uh, it has to be in the bylaws specifying that a board has associates, right. or in the case of zoning. But nowhere does it specify it has to be a resident. Either. No. 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 So I elected think, are the only ones, obviously. Right. Yeah. Have to be a resident. I'd be inclined. I can't because I can't think of a good reason. And there appears to be more than ample opportunity for anyone to participate on an ad hoc basis. I can't think of a good reason to perpetuate this or a problem that's created by eliminating it. Anyone feel differently? No, I, I'm, I agree. Um, I'm, I can imagine, now I'm, I'm trying to remember when you, when there was a tax classification subcommittee, and I don't really remember what that was called, whether that was an ad hoc or whatever it was. Um, but you may well want to appoint people who are not residents for specific purposes. Yep. Would that be more from a consulting standpoint, right? So not, well, so a voting not so member. Um, there were six people on that committee. Oh, I see what you're saying, because the they may not be able to have associates. Yeah, Leo Kenny. The business Leo Kenny on the town's town. He, he was from out of town. Right. Yeah. right. Right. So there are instances where you may want to specifically have someone that doesn't live in there. Yeah. 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 Or you say all boards, committees, and commissions can have associates. Would be the would be the alternate, and then you could take that because then you could yeah. still get consultation yeah. on That's from like that. all boards appointing boards. Yeah. 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 But then I, I'm not aware that there's a problem, mm -hmm. other than there's certainly some misunderstanding on some board. And it, it makes sense. The default thought should be you have to be a resident. That's just not the case. And, and another example of where you wouldn't want that to be the case, in, in quite a lot of circumstances, there are employees who are not residents who are on boards. Board of Assessor. The chief appraiser is often the chair of the Board of Assessors. They don't have to live in that town. Um, there's, uh, there's a board, there's, uh, I think it's the audit committee right now. They're going to have a resignation and they're wondering if they should nominate an employee who does not live in Reading. So that's another example where that may be the wish of the board. Okay, so there are good reasons why there are creative problems. That's why we talk about it. Mm -hmm. um, Bob, does the current wording allow FinCom to investigate records without putting it on the town warrant now? Or do we um, still have that problem yeah, in there? Yes, that was passed. OK. Good. Any other comments? No. Thanks. 
board. Okay. Um, there was one other thing. So establishment of boards and committees, no finance committee member shall be an elected or appointed town officer or an employee, mm -hmm. um, you know, other than town meeting. But my understanding is the proposed building committee is talking about having members of FinCom on there. So wouldn't that be a contradiction in that? Let me look. It could be a liaison by the voting member. Yeah. <clears throat> so here are the five permanent members. Well, there's the. They're not meant to be anyone from FinCom, I would say. Here's okay. their. Here's their background. All right, so it's right. not okay. Then it's not a problem. Okay. But would it preclude having a FinCom member? Um, it doesn't specify. It. Well, they wouldn't be able. They can't be because a of the charter. Member. They right. could be. A, they could be a liaison, yeah, right? right? They could be a non-voting non participant. But yeah, they're appointed by the chairman of the board and selectmen, chairman of the board, yeah. board and they their moderator. Well, that's this is a proposal again. That's also part of January town meeting. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't a contradiction there. That's all. All right. Any other comments? Did we ever get a clarification on the piece of town meeting complaint with the open meeting line? I um, put it in there. The town council says that any committee of town meeting must follow open well, meeting law. And I know you don't agree with that. Well, and uh, he knows you don't I, agree I, with I, that. It isn't that I don't <laughs> agree with it. The district, uh, the attorney general of the United States. Yeah, I, I, citation, Bill? I mean, huh? it's kind of important to have a specific citation. I'll, I'll ask him again, but I know I've asked him. Well, uh, I will bring it he up. He said only, only town meeting itself is exempt from open uh, meeting law. If you, if you know of a specific ruling, yeah. produce it's, it. It's, it's in the open meeting laws uh, that we just had. In fact, I, I got a specific uh, answer from the district attorney's office. Okay. feel it should be in the charter, regardless of whether the town council agrees or not, because town councils come and go, the attorney generals come and go. And if it's in the Remember charter, that point. there's no harm, to, in my opinion, there's no harm of being in there. I actually do have one other charter thing. So the bylaw committee right now there's nothing oh, yeah. in here about what the bylaw committee's purpose is. Yeah, I, I, the I, actually, I'm so glad you really reminded me about that. should actually have some very specific direction, like they're checking to make sure something's consistent with town law, that it's consistent within itself. It should not be the forum for people's public personal opinions to be made in front of town meeting. And unfortunately, that is the way it's been used. And I, I, I'm very strongly opposed yeah. to that. Yes. Bob? Um, I was at a bylaw committee meeting at some point in the last few weeks and didn't bring up that subject, but brought up the question, would they be fine to only review general bylaws and not zoning bylaws because zoning bylaws mm -hmm. go through an excruciating process? And they supported <laughs> that. <laughs> they supported that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the bylaw committee had a whole night all by itself for the zoning rewrite, and actually they have the zoning. So they're always looking at zoning bylaws, and they all agreed, why are we doing this? So they're going to suggest that change to the charter committee. But I, I would also but yours is a different point. Do, mine is a different point, which is to yeah. give them a very specific purpose. It's not just you're reading this and then you're stating what your personal opinion do is. We point yes, we do. We do. And don't we give everybody? No, we don't. We actually, or, we actually, as a, as a board, we're no, appointed at by fault committee, in right? in. <laughs> Yeah. Appointment committee. Well, the appointment committee should well, give them up for this topic came up certainly yeah. in the charter committee because <clears throat> there's different feelings in that in that group as well. And um, they asked town council, "What's your experience?" And he said, "It's absolutely all over the map. Mm -hmm. um, some people try to define it. Some people leave it quite loose." He said, "There is absolutely no standard for this in the common." But that there is no standard doesn't argue that we. And we shouldn't have no, but people were asking, is there a best practice? And the answer is no. Is there any practice? There is not even a common none. practice. <laughs> yeah. this, it's very much an individualized taste kind of thing. I've raised this at the charter committee meeting myself. I've also raised this prior to becoming a, a member of the board. Mm -hmm. And I can't describe to anyone what the bylaw committee does other than use their best judgment in terms of the intent and construction of the language. But they're not compelled to do any of that. A bill is the charter committee 
uh, is there a sense in the Charter Committee that this is a void that needs to be filled? I think there's a split. I don't see a reason for the Rules Committee either, actually. I quite frankly was wondering why we have that. Do they actually meet? When's the last time they met? As needed. Have they made any changes? Actually, I think the language changed from annually to as needed. As needed. Well, I think, I think it says once, at least every 10 years, right, in, years. The new, <laughs> in the new thing, but uh, do That's we even charter. need it? That's every 10 years. Oh, okay. And is the ship sailed on the argument that we enumerate each and every committee? Is that? Mm -hmm. um, they've added in three. Uh, you know, whatever. I, I mean, think fast forward this ten the years. The Charter Commission is in there. That's one more. But fast forward this ten years when these various committees either are with their purpose or need to change. Mm -hmm. yeah. We've got it now so restrictive, or it's written in a way that it's so restrictive and specific, it doesn't provide any interpretation. No. One of the, the Charter Committee and the Bylaw Committee <laughs> just walked in the room. One of the, one of the, something we said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm watching home for 20 minutes now. <laughs> oh, thank you for coming in. This <laughs> <laughs> the first recorded case of that ever happening. <laughs> well, you didn't come in angry. That's what well, usually well, happens. Well, well, usually well, there's the, the second time. I remember one time when talking about dual <laughs> water rates for meters. And suddenly 125 <laughs> people showed up in the room, all of them with two meters. <laughs> <laughs> it was amazing. Um, so, if, uh, I'll ask you, Steve, one of the questions we have is, in at least two prior occasions, we've asked ourselves individually and publicly, shouldn't there be something more prescriptive about what it is the bylaw committee is charged with doing, not merely that it exists, and not merely broadly describing what it does? It certainly couldn't be much less. That's one of my frustrations. It's just sort of very open-ended. Yeah. And I'm, I personally don't believe that it should be a format for people to give their personal opinions in front of town meeting, which is the way it has been used. And, and I, that, so that I have asked that question of the rules committee. And I don't, I don't think that's an appropriate use of the bylaw. Like committee. A year and a half or so ago, and they were very clear about that too. They felt like, as you feel. But it, but yet it hasn't been enforced in that manner. <laughs> so. Well, we, I, I think we've tried in the last year or two. Uh, yeah, the time I've been changed. on it uh, to, to be narrow. I, I so much described it as sort of putting on my narrow bylaw sort of yeah. point of view on things. Um, the consistency issues with existing bylaws. Yeah. Uh, the bylaw committee members now are in the habit of saying, as a bylaw committee member, I think this. However, as a town meeting member, I think this. So they understand yeah. the difference. Yeah. But that understanding isn't, isn't uh, <coughs> embodied in this language. Mm -hmm. No. It's not, and that would be good if it was. What is the sense of the board? Is that, I agree with that, that statement. One, one of the things that I suggested to start off with is take all the appointed bodies and put them in the bylaws and mm -hmm. not have them in the charter. Mm -hmm. I, agree I got shot that. down very shortly, very quickly. Um, yeah. I think that makes a lot of sense. In the spirit of recommendation, I guess that would be a general board request that they formalize at least one sentence that says what they affirmatively do. Scope of bylaw. Yeah. Something else, Steve. You came all the way down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Tell me about those double you um, <laughs> I, I back up to 213A. My impression of the intent of A, which isn't really changing from what was written 10 years ago, maybe in 1984, is the selectmen, I think, get extra wiggle room to get things on the warrant over and above any other. Boards, committees, commissions. I think it's the intent. You've got a lot of leeway with only requiring only two of you. Yeah. Right. So, but I think it, I think that that the charter I think is trying to treat the selectmen as special or above most of the other ordinary sort of the, the top executives. Right. Mm -hmm. I think we got that. The, the concern was that two might be misrepresented as a rule of the majority. Can we address that by describing it as two or more name members? So that it's clear that it's we're proposing a change so that A becomes two or more named yeah. members. Well, I imagine the entire board could take a vote to recommend or not recommend a thing later after a thing. We, we actually do. We, we just we did do. that. Yeah. Um, 
And just because it gets on the warrant, it means you can talk about it at a town meeting. It doesn't mean the town meeting will do anything with it, necessarily. Well, I think to your point, I, I mean, you know, the more I thought about I mean, there was a side of me that thought, we vote on everything, shouldn't we have a majority? And then I, as I began to understand what you, what you said, that you were trying to, there were extra rights that went along with the Or at decision. least that's my sense, personally. No, but I, I, if, you, if you really think this through, that's clearly the yeah. message. Yeah. And so I, and I said at that point, and I'll say again because you're here and we're talking about it, if I have a right, I don't tend to vote it away from myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard, I heard you say that. Yeah, I mean, um, and so I think that by changing that, other than to say name numbers, I think that is appropriate. Clarifies. You, you don't hide behind anything. You come out and you say, "This is what I'm doing. This is why I think I'm doing it. I have the right to do it." And on we go. As long as I, as long as I have a partner. You know, the, the other thing, speaking as an individual, I think the any hundred for special town meeting versus any ten for the annual or subsequent recognizes that you are required to have an annual. So everybody has one always. You, if you wish to, can also have a subsequent. Which we do. And we have to because of some. But as, as I read it, I could be wrong. If the hundred or more request it, you were then obligated to, to generate a warrant and have a special no. town meeting. No, because the last clause covers that. I, I was of that belief. Right here for the yeah. next schedule. So the, it's yeah. up to the board to schedule a special town meeting. They're they right. don't have to schedule it just okay. because someone asks for it. Which means you might want to make that then as well. Why a higher burden? As long as it's yeah, coming up in the next schedule. And I asked town council that petition that was circulated, I don't think it's correct. First of all, it had the wrong date. It said uh -oh. January 2014. He said that was fine. They said they haven't even called a town meeting yet. It should have just said the next town meeting. He said that's fine. <laughs> well, why is it fine if it's not right? I was surprised that he allowed the different year. I, why is it fine if it's not right? And when is it not fine? I mean, so we could just do anything we want? He said, I don't know. I asked him, and I was surprised at his decision. I, that, I, that really troubles me, I will tell you. I mean, yeah, the, the thing clerk, is in the bad wrong, form. Well, the town clerk drew it up, just to be clear. Well, I, put it in the wrong year. I, I, I oh, don't care who drew it up. If yeah. it's in bad form, yeah, as a matter of fact, I can tell you, date was as a citizen, form. I was sent out of here, out of this room, from that chair, <laughs> over bad form. Mm -hmm. I was. Like I just the form. Yep. <laughs> uh, so simplified, I think maybe change C to voters of annual, subsequent, or special town meeting. Yeah, that'd be yeah. Period. Yeah. And, 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 then and take D. Strike D. And strike D. Yeah. yeah. Everybody's happy. Yeah, if, if everybody feel, right. if everyone feels that that's that's what they want, that would be but definitely the way to do it. Pressure. Okay. okay. Back to a warrant that's going into town into the special town meeting. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Why is that going to go in bad form? Town council says I, it's not I think you need to take that one up later. <laughs> Directly with town That's council. Great. Is form, <laughs> yeah, is form right. determined exclusively by town council, or does the board of selectmen petition the execution of any of these duties? Hmm. It's determined by the town clerk and town council. Are they both in agreement? I don't know if the town clerk even knows. I didn't mention it. She knows. Okay. <laughs> As I say, I was a little surprised. I thought it had to be precisely, exactly. That's what I thought. Uh, that has been the direction of this board at other times. And the reason, and by the way, we all agonized through this uh, referendum petition section where you couldn't have extraneous marks. Right. You had to have the preprinted right. form, and that was walking through brown glass to get there over the course of two years. And I still have scars to show. And, <laughs> and perhaps we didn't need to be walking through well, that's, brown that's glass an interesting to do point, that, but right? This town council may tell you. Look, state election law covers all this. That's all you needed is whatever. I, I we can't actually speak. tried to argue that at that point. Yeah, well, shame on us then. But it, the question was clearly asked and clearly answered. Well, it will be asked again. <laughs> so, I, I think that's very solvent. All right. Just pop um, it down. Any other okay. comments on the charter? If not so, do you board. wish to lower that to 10? That's the board. board. I, I'm fine. I, I'm fine. I would like to lower it. Okay. The pressure off of it. So change it. Change well, it. We were changing a, a 
And then if if that's the case, then what, I think what Bill's saying just makes sense. So you can strike D and just add it yep. to C. Yep. You strike it. It's just gone. Yeah, and put it, put the special into yeah, C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. For any town meeting, period. For any so town meeting. Yeah. That's just, that's in, into the next part. town meeting. Into, the, into any, any other next town meeting. Before we move on? Yeah. No. All right. Back at our two sets of minutes. Can I do it one more? Sure. Mm -hmm. um, move the board to select and approve the minutes of October 28, 2014. Second. Second. Any discussion? I actually have Thanks, a Bob. number of changes, but I don't have them down, written down. Um, and it seems unlikely I'm going to get them quickly. So. You want to, you want to move that to the I, I would, move I the would table like it. that we could table it yeah. and just uh, yeah. do it later. Move the table. The, uh, Thank you. Yeah. Second. Okay. All those in favor of tabling the approval of minutes? Uh, October 28th. October 28th. Thank you. Next, <laughs> move for a second and approve the minutes of October 29th, 2014, as amended. That's the I was not there, but I did notice that there actually is an error. I, I'm pretty sure that that um, the motion was to use 1.7 million in free cash, not to sue. <laughs> 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 yeah. So that was just my one. That looks like a comment. typo. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a typo, perhaps. I wasn't there. Uh, it's um, it's page Thank four. You know. It's the very uh, end of it. Get the list and I'll, I appreciate your cooperation. Some in particular meetings put up with. <laughs> Sorry, on the charter committee. We're going to note down that you gave him a compliment. Yes. <laughs> we're not going to we're not going to tell him about it, but we're going to note it. He and town council made a lot of difference. We we appreciate right. the nice comment from Paul Sylvester about town council. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Have a good night. Good night. Good night. Any other comments on the October twenty ninth minute? All those in favor of the minutes as written? Against? Abstain. As, as amended. As amended. Right. As right. amended. Right. I, I know that's what you meant. Right. It's 401. Oh, thank you. Uh, should we move or should we wait? Um, we should probably move to we'll move. Yeah. Move for a select and go into executive session to discuss strategies with respect to collective bargaining. If, and the chairman declares an open meeting may have detrimental effect on the negotiation position of the body. And not. This is a roll call. First of all, do I have a second? Second. This is a roll call vote. Evan Sexton? Yes. Marcy West? Yes. John Arena, yes. Dave yes. Eisenhower? Yes. John Holliday? We are adjourned. Okay. All right. <laughs> Miles to but sign. But you don't have to wait. <laughs> Miles to sign. What the heck is this for? Uh, I don't know. Open it up. I don't know. Oh, popcorn. I'm going to wait until everybody gets done. We got popcorn. I'm going to go into the executive session of my own. This is the uh, public private uh, partnerships. Uh, we got the uh, Are we back in the public?